I see the number of participants is still increasing a little bit, so can wait a couple of minutes. Okay, I think we can start. On behalf of the Anura 3D NPM community, I welcome all of you to this Anura 3D workshop. Um, I will uh, give you a brief um, introduction of the material point method for uh, those of you that um, are not very familiar with it. And then I will uh, explain very briefly the history of our code and Ura 3D and our ongoing research activities and eventually also how you can contribute as a user or as a developer. Um, as you know, large uh, displacement problems are quite um, common in uh, geotechnical engineering. Let's think about the installation problem or impact problems all the theme of slope stability, dike and levee collapse, but also problem of erosion and liquefaction as well as underground excavation. In all these cases, the um, updated Lagrangian finite element method that has been used for decades in geotechnical engineering is not suitable to simulate this problem because of issue with element uh, distortions. So to overcome these uh, difficulties, uh, Several methods are being developed. For example, the material point method, that is one we will discuss today, but also others, such as the arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian method, the coupled Eulerian Lagrangian method, the smoothed particle hydrodynamics, the particle finite element method, and many others. Um, the material point method uses two levels of discretization. On one hand, the continuum body is discretized with a cloud of material points that trace all the properties of the continuum, the mass, the velocity, acceleration, stress, strain, material parameters, everything. On the other hand, the space, what the body will move through, is discretized with a background mesh that cover the space and is used to assemble and solve the governing equation of motion, but does not store any permanent information. At the beginning of each time step or load step, all the information is mapped from the material point to the node of the mesh. At the node of the mesh, uh, we calculate the solution of the governing equation, and this solution is used to update all the quantities at the material point strain, stresses, but also acceleration, velocity, and displacement. Finally, the material point moves through the mesh. 
flash displacement uh, are simulated with the material point moving through the mesh. There are many applications of the material point method in geomechanics, for example, all kinds of granular flows, such as example of uh, column collapse uh, or even impact on structures and so on. Slope stability problems, such as earthquake or rainfall induced landslides, uh, also progressive failures, stability of dike and levees, and many others. Um, it can also be used to simulate soil penetration problems, such as uh, stability of shallow foundation, pile installation, or installation of instruments such as uh, CPT, DMT, and so on, and also anchor pull-out. Um, the coupled formulation can also be used for erosion problems, uh, such as uh, overflow, subfusion, tunnel gashing, and so on. There are many available MPM software. This is uh, a list of the one we are aware of. Um, but the software that um, it has been used for all the applications you will see today is uh, Anura 3D. Uh, Anura 3D is an open source uh, uh, code and the um, community developed this software um, with special emphasis on soil water structure interaction problem. We have a relatively large community of developers and users, and here you can see uh, some of the university that um, contributed the most to the development of uh, this uh, uh, software. Uh, university and research centers, for example, um, Deltares, the Technical University of uh, Hamburg Harbor, University of Cambridge, Virginia Tech, University of Padova, University of uh, um, Barcelona, Technical University of Barcelona, Politecnico of Milan, and University of Berkeley. Uh, the first line of this code uh, was um, uh, written in uh, 2008. From the very beginning, the code was 3D, dynamic and explicit. Uh, then uh, other features were uh, developed and added, such as contact algorithm, multi-phase formulation, and other features. The first memorandum of understanding that um, basically started uh, officially this community was signed in uh, 2014. And after that, uh, um, other university joined uh, the, um, uh, our uh, community. The first release of the executable was in 2016. And in 2017, we organized the first uh, MPM conference, followed by a second one in 2019. We will have a third one uh, next year, as we will announce later. Uh, in 2021, we released uh, the source code, open source, um, under the LGPL license. Um, we had a release uh, more or less uh, every year with new development. Anura 3D is a research code, and this means that some of the functionalities are still under development, or maybe they are not fully tested and generalized. So you do not have to expect uh, um, the level of the commercial code, because our goal is to advance the state of the art uh, of modeling large deformation and soil water structure interaction. Uh, Anura 3D uh, research community keep developing new feature that will be added to the open source code uh, in uh, the future. So we try to release uh, every year uh, a code which is um, better or with more functionalities than the previous one. Our current research activities are uh, regarding slope stability, soil penetration problem, internal erosion, also external erosion, underground explosion, pipeline stability, tunnel stability, and so on. Uh, in the Anura 3D MPM research community, we have developers that implement new features in the code and users that apply the code. There is a core developer team that coordinates the development uh, and the new release. And since the code is open source, everybody can contribute to the development of Anura 3D. If you are a developer, you can implement new features or uh, improvement uh, 
that can eventually be included in the code. And if you contact uh, the core development team, we will be happy to do that. Uh, if you are a user, you can uh, certainly still contribute uh, by, report, by, for example, uh, reporting your new application or new validations with the real cases, uh, also finding eventually bugs, we hope not so many, uh, but also suggesting uh, uh, new development for the future or um, improvement. And I also remind you that in uh, our website, uh, we have a discussion session that can be used to ask questions about the code, but also for suggestions. Um, the release, we have this here, include 2023, include these features. So you can run 3D simulations, but also 2D plane strain and axis symmetric. You can use uh, explicit and explicit time integration scheme, although the implicit one is not fully developed. Constitutive model, uh, by default, we have linear elastic, Mohr Coulomb, and Bingham. However, you can include your own user-defined model, also with a DLL. Uh, we have several multi-phase formulations. So we will have the one-phase, two-phase with single point for saturated and unsaturated soil two-phase double point for saturated soil, and also the three-phase for unsaturated soil. Um, we have several um, features to model boundary and initial condition, and also contact uh, between bodies and so on. Um, this is, uh, the, these are the main feature of our code. So um, now I would like to uh, start the, um, the workshop. This is our uh, program. Uh, we have uh, five present, uh, presentation, then a little uh, lunch break, followed by the presentation of the Anura 3D 2023 open source release at 1.30. Uh, this time our Central European time, so time of um, Rome, Paris, uh, Berlin, and so on. Um, we follow some more other uh, presentation and we uh, finally have uh, a final discussion at about five uh, this afternoon. And I hope you will be able to participate. Um, so uh, I asked to my colleague uh, Alba and Alexander if you have uh, maybe anything to add uh, to what I said up to now. No, thank you. <laughs> we, I just we, we can to... take. We can. Uh, you want to Sorry, add something, no, no. Alba? Just wanted to well welcome everyone and highlight that uh, we have the website that Francesco already mentioned. That is uh, www.anora3d.com. And that, uh, again, um, that the discussion section, it's important to us because we can get the feedback from all of you, but you also can find there other activities that we organize. So maybe, Alex, you can mention us something about the next year important yes. activity. Yeah. Yes, thanks a lot. Yeah, also for me, uh, a big welcome to everyone who's participating today, the workshop. Um, Yes, before we start, we will mention this few times because we have like kind of an international audience and some people might join now and not join later. So there will be an announcement coming up the next weeks. Follow our GitHub website where all the news are published. So we will uh, hold a, in the third international NPM conference on soil structure interaction in Hamburg next year. It will be September 24. So like just stay tuned and um, the announcement will come within the next like weeks. I guess we will have everything fixed that we can announce it and uh, reach out to you. Well, okay. So by being this said, uh, I think we can open the first session of today's workshop. And I would like to introduce you the first presentation uh, held by Veronica Geraghi from the University of Padua with the title Wetting Induced Instabilities in Layered Slopes. So, Veronica, can you share your screen with us? Yes. Yes. 
just like one more thing for the audience you have the the questions and answers option in zoom where you can during the presentation state something we will read it afterwards as long as there will be time and if there will be time left at the end of the session we will have maybe a little conversation discussion together so please the stage is yours veronica thank you so much can you see my screen in presentation mode yes really good okay Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm Veronica Girardi. Uh, presently, I'm working in a Pini Group uh, company, which is a company focused on uh, design of infrastructures and construction management. But previously, I was PhD student and postdoc at the University of Padova, where I carried out uh, most of my research uh, with uh, the NPM and in particular with Anura 3D. Today, I'm going to present you the results of a study um, focus on um, layer slopes undergoing wetting carried out with uh, the unsaturated uh, formulation of uh, Anura 3D, uh, the single point one. So layer slopes are extremely widespread in nature. And uh, um, when I speak about layer slopes, uh, of course, I refer to heterogeneous slopes with some layers at variable depth, uh, which have um, different uh, properties, hydraulic strength or stiffness compared to the surrounding materials. And uh, after uh, numerous uh, observations on the field, observing landslide, uh, we have been gaining knowledge uh, about uh, the importance of these uh, layers at depth, especially as predisposing factors of landslides or slope failure in general. In addition to this, um, we can not only consider the uh, heterogeneity at the macro scale of the slope, we have also to consider that uh, um, slope failure is induced by another important factor, which is the variation or alteration of the pore pressure distribution, the pre-existent one, which is uh, usually triggered by a wetting phenomenon that can be either rainfall or of, uh, from a different source. And um, after you know, understanding that the combination of complex stratigraphies with layering and variation of the pore pressure distribution can, can foster slope failure, um, as researchers and engineers, we have started investigating this kind of phenomena in the lab through small scale laboratory tests and also in the field with large scale tests. So if on a side, uh, all the experience that we have gained on the field is, has been really important and deepened and has um, created much more knowledge about these problems, on the other side, if we have a look on the numerical tools that we are using uh, commonly to predict these events, um, they are still kind of limited. And I am in particular referring to the limit equilibrium method and finite element method, which are computationally very e efficient, super user friendly, but uh, they are limited uh, to the uh, onset of failure reproduction through the uh, quantification of the factor of safety, but they can help us having a, a good um, risk uh, um, analysis um, because they can't go after failure and not give us any information about the post failure behavior. This is something that we can achieve with large displacement approaches like the material point method. So here it comes the idea of the study I'm presenting you today and the objective of the study, uh, which is investigating uh, um, the effects on slope failure and post failure behavior of soil layering and different wetting mechanisms. In particular, uh, we ultimately want to, wanted to understand how can NPM can support the advancement of knowledge about wetting induced lens, like how much is proficient this tool and mature right now to investigate and reproduce this phenomena. So uh, in our research group, we have developed uh, the unsaturated single point formulation, and we believe it was um, the perfect you know, tool to uh, account for hydromechanical couplings and especially to mimic the wetting process or mm, a saturation process, which is uh, um, managed um, by uh, carefully playing with the hydraulic boundary condition, which I just want to remind you that are in uh, Anura 3D in this formulation, uh, transient and uh, um, fully able to follow moving boundaries. Uh, what I'm going to show you today is just an extract of a bigger study, and for the complete uh, uh, results, you can refer to the um, publications that I have reported in this slide. So in what does the uh, study consist? First of all, in setting up a model, a simplified model of a slope for meter high with 20 degrees inclination. And uh, uh, this slope, um, as it is visible here, this section of the slope is characterized by two materials, the slope material, soil one, and a layer at one meter depth from the surface, 0 0.6 meter thickness, incline um, with the same angle of the slope, but with different material properties. 
in this table, I am reporting the complete uh, set, more or less the complete set of material properties of the two soil. And as you can see, there is an important contrast in hydraulic conductivity of the um, low permeability layer compared to the surrounding soil. Plus, we have a difference in terms of strength parameters. We use more Coulomb constitutive model in these preliminary studies. So we can say that the slope material is more frictional while the layer is a little more cohesive. And um, in terms of boundary condition, the bottom uh, border of the layer, especially the incline uh, part, is fixed and um, in, uh, impermeable. So resembling the behavior of a, a rigid, a rigid uh, bedrock. Uh, so, how did we mimic different wetting processes? So, first of all, um, we, we work, as we said, on uh, hydraulic boundary condition, and uh, two um, scenarios were reproduced. So, the first one is an upstream recharge, uh, which was managed by applying a total head, the light blue one, on the left edge of uh, the model in the left picture. Uh, and a potential seepage phase was applied on the surface of the model. While on the right side, um, uh, we uh, model a different scenario, uh, aim at mimicking simulating an intense rainfall. And for this case, the hydraulic boundary conditions were very different. Uh, it, was, uh, um, it consisted in the application of a suction equal to zero along the surface. In both the cases, the initial condition in terms of pore pressure distribution uh, was um, defined with the K note procedure in Anura 3D, which allows for linear or nonlinear uh, suction distribution above the initial water table. And uh, in both the two scenarios, the simulations were run for approximately 60 minutes to track failure and the post failure behavior. Before showing you the NPM results, I want to show you the results of a preliminary limit equilibrium method analysis uh, that was carried out to highlight uh, um, the important difference that uh, uh, occurs when you use a large displacement approach like NPM compared to limit equilibrium method. So as you can see, uh, in both the two cases, upstream recharge and intense rainfall, failure is predicted by the limit equilibrium method, but at different times. So at two minutes for the first case and 15 seconds in the second one, and uh, the uh, slip surface, as a different, uh, um, different location. So we have a deeper um, potential movement in the first case, while a more shallow movement in the uh, second case. Uh, we have a different pore pressure distribution. But after factor of safety quantification, we can't say anything anymore after this uh, um, determination. You know. So before going into the um, evolution of failure, I want to show you the pore pressure evolution in the NPM results. Uh, to this aim, I isolated a section at mid-height of the slope, and uh, I reported the pore pressure along the height. So initial condition, you have the same pore pressure distribution for, two, for the two cases. On the top, uh, you have the upstream recharge. At the bottom, you have rainfall. After 15 seconds, uh, you, have, um, you can clearly see the um, pressure becoming negative in the uh, second case and factor of safety less than one. But the displacements are really, really tiny. So the factor of safety in LEM couldn't tell us anything about the actual movement that was going on. This is, on the other side, possible with NPM. Uh, if we have a look at two minutes, we have the instability also of the upstream uh, recharge case. We have negative pressure in the bottom part, especially due to the fact that the low permeability layer and the uh, bottom impermeable boundary are somehow helping the accumulation of pore pressure in the bottom part. And then we have the distribution of pressure pretty similar in both the cases, almost saturating the entire slope. With the animation I'm presenting in this slide, you can see at the top the upstream recharge case and at the bottom the rainfall case. And you can see the evolution of failure in the two cases. So in the first one, you see that is deeper, more progressive, while in the first case is much shallower, uh, somehow semi-planar. The shapes are very similar uh, compared to the LEM uh, results. By analyzing uh, further the kinetic energy of the system in both the cases as a function of time, we can see that the full mobilization occurs at different instants, as it was also highlighted, I mean, in terms of factor of safety less than one in the limit equilibrium method analysis. But we can see that in the upstream recharge case, we have an initial, um, let's say, movement, and then the peak of kinetic energy occurs much later, somehow showing a sort of precursor of failure behavior highlighted uh, by um, the simulation with NPM, 
while in the second case, the rainfall one, we have um, most of the mobilization at the very beginning, but then some subsequent peaks uh, um, resembling a sort of reactivation, subsequent reactivation movement due to the injection of water. The final displacements have similar magnitude for the two cases. However, there are different areas where plastic deformation accumulates near the toe for the first case, more shallow in the second case. And um, an aspect that is somehow a little bit of a drawback uh, is the quantification of the runout. In this case, we have to uh, notice that the use of the Mort Coulomb constitutive model probably limited the potential runout. So there is an underestimation. And this is important to highlight the aspect that we cannot only use large displacement approach to actually back analyze or predict a phenomenon, we have also to carefully choose the constitutive model that can help us reproducing the behavior of um, the soil we are investigating. Lastly, I want to show you the results in terms of deviatoric or plastic strain. So in this case, compared to LEM, we don't predefine a slip surface. We can see the, the progressive accumulation of plastic strains in certain areas, which then you know, favor the uh, slip along this area, and then the movement of the entire slope. Uh, I, uh, here in this slide, I reported you the contour of the viatoric strain at the maximum peak of kinetic energy for, for both the cases, so approximately 30 minutes. And further on, we can also um, quantify displacement, horizontal and vertical, so both components along the time, to um, support uh, risk uh, evaluation, especially if like, you know, a community or urbanization is present close to the toe of uh, the slow. So here you can clearly see you know, the different reactivation movements and the different behaviors that um, undergo our slope in the top or in, in, at the crest area or near the foot. So to conclude, um, with the, these preliminary MPM simulation, two potential saturation mechanisms reveal uh, different slope behaviors with strong similarities with real events. So on a side, when the water table rises due to upstream injection, the unstable soil mass is deep and tends to move progressively, maintaining its extension. While on the other side, the intense rainfall induce an initially shallow movement, rapid resembling a sort of brittle trend. In both the cases, the layer uh, with a reduced hydraulic conductivity compared to the surrounding material played a predominant role in determining the initial localization of the slip surface, probably even more than strength. And the subsequent reactivation phases were observed due to the continuous water injection, so the continuous application of the hydraulic boundary conditions, which is, again, very similar to real events. We have also to say that in real cases, it is much more complex and there are more factors involved in reactivation movements of landslides. But this aspect was still nicely captured by the NPM. NPM furthermore um, allowed a step forward um, considering the limited equilibrium method analysis and pro by providing the progression of the actual slope uh, um, failure behavior in time. And hopefully this study highlighted the potential of NPM and the unsaturated NPM in slope safety assessment and support of risk mitigation design, also in complex stratigraphical conditions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Veronica. I will just try one thing and just let me know if you can hear it. If I click now, is there a signal that someone can yes. hear? OK, that's great. So this will be the signal for the uh, next speakers from my side when you reach, let's say, 12 minutes, but you managed really good. We still have a little time left for one or two questions. One do we have already here, and the question is, wait, I have to read it. So the question is, why is that the soil water characteristic curve is not required in your analysis? The working file is very important uh, to new user like me. Would you kind enough to share with me, please? <laughs> okay, so like, so first of all, uh, the first question about the characteristic, the water characteristic curve. Yes, so no, it is uh, for sure an input of the analysis, the soil water retention curve. I didn't uh, didn't mention it. Um, we used a, a Van Genuchten water retention soil curve, which is one of the different uh, kind of um, hydraulic models that we have in uh, Anura 3D implemented. And in this case, since we were not referring to any like case, you know, real that we were trying to back analyze, we just selected some um, parameter calibration parameters that uh, were somehow compatible with the, the soil we were thinking about. So the slope soil was more like a sandy soil, while the layer, the low permeability layer was more silty clay. So 
we mm, use some calibration parameter based on this uh, consideration taken from, from the literature. So the soil water retention curve was for sure specified. Concerning the hydraulic conductivity curve, that one was kept constant. Um, so usually it can be specified in a manner that it is function of saturation degree. But in this case, to keep it constant to start, we kept it uh, equal to the hydro uh, saturated hydraulic conductivity along the time. OK. Thank you very much. I think regarding You're sharing welcome. the files, uh, uh, this is a discussion for later. Um, we don't have other questions. Maybe I will ask one uh, before we move to the next speaker. I uh, know oh, we have another one. Uh, which constitutive model did you use and does it consider the suction? So we use a simple Mor Coulomb. There is a version of Mor Coulomb with the as a function of suction in uh, Anura 3D, but in this case we use the simple simple one. So cohesion and friction were not depending on suction, but there is a manner to account for this also in a non-linear manner. So an increment of cohesion where the when the soil is unsaturated, but it was uh, it was not considered in this initial step. But for sure it can represent a good um, development, a good input for future development of this work. Thank you very much. You're so welcome. One, once more, thank you very much, Veronica. Thank We're moving you. on to the thank next you for speaker. Me here. Um, our next speaker is Yiping Peng from the National Taiwan University. Uh, and her presentation has the title Investigation of the Progressive Failure of the Guanghua. I hope I read it correctly, landslide using the material point methods. Yes, you. Thank you for the invitation. Hello, I am Yiping Peng. Okay. Yeah, maybe make, make, uh, yeah. can you enlarge your yes, now we can see oh, it yes. clearly. Okay. Hello, thank you. I am Yiping Pen from Taiwan University and I am the assistant research assistant now and the co-writers are Dr. William Lin and uh, Dr. Bo Xin Yang. Uh, our topic is investigation of the progressive value of a Gronghua landslide using the material point method. Uh, because it's a case study, so I will go through some uh, background information of this landslide and also uh, the reason why we choose Anual 3D, uh, the material point method. Okay, to start with, uh, Gronghua landslide is a reverse slope in Taiwan, and since 2002, it's slowly slide and uh, it's more than 20 years movement. And in 2018, it start to move. Uh, it start to do investigation in the morning. However, in 2021, it's uh, accelerated sliding, and the last year is gradually slowed down. As you can see, the right hand side picture. Uh, what's the special on this then slide is the slope on the upper slope is quite mild, at only 20 to 30 degrees, but on the down slope is quite steep, which means uh, the equipment and the fracking is harder to access to do investigation. And what we consider on this uh, slope is because if the soil mass, of our soil mass falling down, is the will disrupt the uh, land traffic road in Guanghua area and uh, the people live there will get threatened. Oh, no, so it turned out to be our objective is to do the case study on the Guanghua Lane side and uh, to evaluate the failure mechanism, then because of the limitation of the investigation, so we will try to do numerical analysis to evaluate the, the post value behavior. In this land slide, uh, we do a lot of investigation from the ground surface and the underground. And uh, just why I say the limitation on the down, down slope is we cannot uh, now the actual information about the like uh, soil information and uh, the groundwater layer. Uh, and because of the time limitation, I cannot go deeper on this uh, investigation data. So I just uh, quickly conclude the result of this investigation. From both data, we can uh, make sure that the soil layer is two, Corobia and the shell, and the from groundwater layer, we can see that it's a highly positive correlation with the uh, movement and the front incline meter. There is the obvious value surface from the depth of about 27 meter on the upper slope. And then from the digital animation model, as you can see here is a subsidence on the upside and the, the up 
live on the so uh, it's a town we still have lots of uh, important information on no like uh, 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 I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, 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 we're having a little issue with the connection. It's Can you... especially the highly fractured shell layer and the deep value surface because of these uh, feature subsidence and the uplift, which means, and the last is about the post value behavior. The moment is not clear. Can you hear me? Um, yeah, there was a little interruption. Maybe maybe you could switch off your video because then uh, maybe the streaming uh, won't have such an issue. So they can like continue sharing, but just like switch off your video. Maybe it will be better. Because I because oh, I I didn't record the video. I I, I can make it for you. I can make it for you. Give me a sec. So try now. I mean, I switched off your video. So maybe. Maybe the stream will be better now. Can you hear me? Can you still hear me? I can hear you, but maybe my connection. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. So let's let's try and hope. <laughs> Please continue. <laughs> Okay, sorry for my connection. Okay, just why I mentioned we still have some unknown information and it's quite important for the uh, measurement for this slope stability. So it turns out we have to do the numerical analysis on this research and uh, we conclude some features of Gonghua landslide and compare with uh, some common common to see the method like F A F E N L E M M P N P and the sounds so, so where we can get the sets. We found out um, another 3D will be the best suitable for our research because then not only evaluate the post value behavior and simulate the larger deformation. So it started from the definition of the soil parameters. Uh, what I mentioned is I we we use the another uh, is two thousand nineteen versions. So there's no update. Application on groundwater layers. So we try to uh, separate the Colombian layer into one year's uh, upper of the groundwater layer and one is lower. So we do the deduction on the Excuse me, I, I, I have to interrupt you once more because I think I, I think it's really difficult to follow. And also, because uh, this movement is just my say some moving more than uh, twenty years, so it's very hard to simulate in anodity which is explicit and numerical analysis. So we include the ability to accelerate the 
calculation time. And uh, the model from calculation based on these two uh, unknown information, the distribution of virtual formation and the deep value surface, we can we build the three model of factual share. Okay, I think uh, the connection completely broke down. Uh, I, I'm sorry, that was uh, for me at least really hard to understand. Um, I'm not sure if there are any questions <laughs> and if we will manage to 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 uh, establish the connection to have a discussion, we can try. Uh, but I also don't see any questions. Okay. Yeah, that was unfortunately in the beginning was working quite nicely. Unfortunately, the connections start getting worse and worse. Okay. Um, we have time left. Okay. Maybe we can uh, restart the connection when it's better later on. With yes. Yes, so I, I, I would suggest that we just continue and we we will like, shall we try to restart the connection now, Francesca? What do you think? Or, or later? No, no, uh, Dr. Peng, are you okay now? Is it better, your connection? Do you want to try? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, can you hear? Okay, sorry, us? I changed my Wi Fi to the private Wi Fi. How about this now? Oh, yeah, that's maybe. Way okay, maybe I just directly go through the result to make the time. Yeah, that would be delay. great. That, that, that's <laughs> sorry great. Thank you. My... Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes, you can enlarge okay. just your presentation and then uh, now, now the connection seems to be way better. So let's... Okay. Just what I said, that I compared with the result with uh, three uh, meditation. We concluded that the model three result will be best to do the post value behavior analysis. So this is the wrong out behavior of the land side. Okay. As you can see, the SRE has the first uh, share band is of so can upper third from the investigation uh, from the inclometer and the third and the second is generated from the toe to the to the up slope and uh, we can put on the point on the uh, select the point on the surface and uh, see the behavior of the kinetic behavior to see there actually have a three time span from the first year is uh, a shear band uh, first shear band to develop and the second third to divert. And uh, the final, when the soil mass hits the valley, its uh, overall slope will overall soil mass will stop. So the conclusion is actually to answer the initial unknown information. The distribution of the shear formation is from the model three. It's uh, supposed that it will be about sixty meters, and the different value surface is about forty to fifty, as you can see from the picture here. And uh, the third is a failure mechanism. It's actually the have two a uh, failure type. One is the shear failure from the upslope, and uh, the second is deep sea failure from the toe to the upslope. And uh, the fourth is the post failure behavior. There are three period, and uh, the final situation is also the present situation of the Gonghua landslide. And the last one is also our future work and uh, very thank you for the work of Anwan uh, 3D to provide this useful uh, software. But as you can see, like Guanghua Landside and in Taiwan, there still have a lot of uh, mountains like uh, Guanghua. Uh, it's largely influenced by the boundary condition and uh, the, which means the 3D model is necessary to conduct but uh, even though we try to use uh, 2022, and the, the initial stress data still weird to 
um, build uh, to generate. And also just want to say in 2019, there's no groundwater application. So in here, we try to build the in 3D model, still have some limitation about the uh, setup. And also the hydraulic conditions is still not acceptable on 3D model. If the problem can fit, this will be very helpful for the 3D results. Uh, that's all. Thank you for the listening and sorry for my connection. And again, thank you for the work on of the Anua 3D community. That's all. Thank you very much. Now, now, sure. fortunately, uh, we, we, we could hear you way better now. So let's see. There are some questions. Um, so there is a question for you. Uh, I will read it. You mentioned DM. Did you conduct couple DM MPM analysis or have I got it wrong? <laughs> or is it even existing something like that? <laughs> Um, clearly, uh, there actually has two D in my research. One is uh just the sorry, maybe I should tell you the one is the numerical tool about to use a PFC. Yes, we try to conduct plus uh PFC model cannot uh explain the soil behavior in the concept of our soil mechanism. So it's hard to uh, give the results on there. So we try to use something can based on like soil mechanism to do numerical analysis. And another DN is a digital animation model. It's actually the a cloud point to see the movement in different period. Okay, but- Oh, but I have, use have, a molecular have... model. Have, oh, you, sorry. Ha, have, have you uh, made any simulations in DM and CFD coupling? Uh, I guess that was oh, like no, more sorry. Or less the question. All right. We separate the use of PFC 3D and ANUA 3D. Okay. And then, the second, yes. maybe it's because of my connection, I use a more current model in the main soil mass, which may uh, assume to move, and the linear elastic on the bedrock. Okay. That was actually, yeah, you Thank already you re re read, the <laughs> read the question. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. So uh, we will move on to the next speaker. Um, the next speaker is Kun He from the Southwest Jiao Tong University in China. The title of the presentation is MPM based pre and post failure mechanism of a reactive landslide. Yes, that looks good. So yeah, let's start. We are a little bit behind the time. So please start. Yeah, we can't hear anything. Yeah, it's because the microphone is still muted. Would you say something? Sorry, I didn't. Uh, oh, now, now it's great. Microphone, yeah. No, now it's perfect. Okay, thanks. Okay, okay. okay thanks for introducing. I'd like to say thanks for the organization community and you know, thanks for giving me the opportunity to present my work today. This is the research performed during my PhD at Southwest Jiaotong University in China. And I'm glad to share you with you guys. And uh, I would say that in practice, one of the biggest landslide problem that we are facing right now as engineering geology researchers is the hydro hydraulic related or trigger landslide. This kind of landslide may include rainfall induced landslide and uh, uh, reservoir landslide. You know, a landslide mainly involved from a small deformation in the pre failure stage and the large deformation stage after failure. So I, I listed two examples of that in this slide. And we think that one of the best way to tackle the problem is to provide the um, realistic simulation of the deformation and the route process. And for that, we need to uh, a numerical plan for that can definitely handle the small and uh, large deformation of this disaster. So in that way, the hydraulic reacted nest process have the feature of 
fluid and uh, solid uh, interactions, small deformation to rapid route, and this is this study simulated the entire process of a rainfall induced nest at using MPM. Um, we gave a case study in Southwest China. This nest has an error of um, 0.59 millimeter square and a value of 13 millimeter qubit. And uh, before the nest at 14 days of continuous rainfall proceed, the, the nest site of uh, 315 millimeter was observed. We also captured pre failure deformation during the rainfall period, uh, such as tension, cracks, local collapse, and in the study area. And we measured the profile and the strata combination by um, dry holes. Here we used the three methods, include the LEM, FM for the pre failure stage simulation and the MPM for the entire process. And uh, I listed the parameters derived by physical and the mechanical experiments. So firstly, we found that with the uh, rainwater infiltration, the negative power to pressure of ground surface decreased and the front edge erupted into saturated firstly and the groundwater infiltrates into the sliding surface. Consequently, the MPN result are in good great agreement with FEM method and can be conducted to examine small deformation. And also we analysis to the slope stability based on the LEM. We calculate the factor of stability um, of different for this. We can see that uh, the factor of stability decreases with the rainwater infiltration and the potential slide, sliding surface involved from shallow to deep one corresponding to the retrogressive failure mechanism. And we plot the change of factor of stability of two selected shallow and uh, deep sliding surface. And in this case, the maximum pre precipitation on, July, on 13 July induced the unstable of the shallow slope. And uh, we performed the FEM to compute the displacement of the slope during the rainfall period. And the large, the large displacement is observed at the front edge. And you can see that in this plot on your right, it's, we are showing you the monitoring points at the front have larger displacement and vary with the rainfall intensity. When the simulation finished uh, after 14 days rainfall, maximum shear stream concentrated through the front part. And similarly, potential sliding zone is presented in the middle part of the, of the steep scarp. Here we can show you the multiple field change of the pre failure stage. As you can see that we have the initial and the negative power water pressure distribution in this geometry. And then as the simulation advanced, negative value area is reducing and meaning that the power water pressure are increasing, causing the decreasing of effective stress in terms of displacement, the retrogressive deformation is observed first, observed first thing, and at the end of rainfall, deformation around the front, the middle, and the rear part are also observed. This pre failure phenomenon is in good agreement with the field investigation. You know, after failure, after field, I'm sure you are care about the route behavior. So now I'm showing you the, the savage result of MPM. In this case, it is it is divided into three stages. In, initially, the material sliding from the saturated front edge and the power to pressure saturation increased at the rear part. Then retrogressive motion caused power water pressure increased at the middle and formed the secondary sliding surface. And eventually the deposition stage has 
stable power to pressure and uh, saturation distribution. And for the string field, initially the shear string is located at the front slope and uh, extended backwards. Then shear zone formed at the front, middle, and rear parts. That is uh, the retrogressive sliding. After that, multiple sliding zone formed for the multi retrogressive sliding motion. Then shear zone connected at the basin sliding zone, forming com compound uh, sliding. While I have multiple stage shearing at the, the middle part, fin finally, it is uh, the entire sliding movement. And here, I'd like to present uh, the velocity and displacement. Instead of the whole movement with the same velocity, the nice slide moved with uh, differential velocities, particularly at uh, the scalps of the original slope, like uh, um, point A6, point A3, and point A1. Uh, same phenomena can be monitored from the, this uh, uh, specific point, and uh, we, we can find the, the maximum velocity country concentrated at the uh, scalps. Same to the velocity field, displacement also show the differential can, characteristics and uh, the Maximum displacement is observed at the middle scalp, that is uh, 0.83. And uh, this, this uh, formula is matched well with the maximum displacement of um, 580 meter of the reference ground feature mark found, found in the field investigation in the plot on the right. And finally, I'd like to share the runout affected uh, by the analysis type. As you can see from this, this plot, unsaturated with considering both initial groundwater level and uh, the rainfall infiltration has a good pro performance on the simulation of last night runout under the law of hydraulic seepage. The pre, pre exciting groundwater and the, the uh, rainfall infiltration are the main contributing factors to the nice night runout. And uh, here comes the remarks. And this this study explore, explores the pre and the post failure behavior of a uh, uh, rainfall induced nice night, and the way using. We used the material point method. Uh, we explored the pre failure deformations of, the, of this nest site, especially for the variation in power to pressure during the, the rainfall process. And we investigated the post failure process kinematic characteristics and the stream seepage changes during the nest night. And we evaluated the effect of process and the uh, absence of rainfall and uh, present exciting groundwater level on the next side while distant and the uh, and the deposition geometry. And that's all my presentation. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much for this nice presentation. We have right away a question and the question is, how did you simulate infiltration and evaporation at the same time? Did you use different water retention curves for the infiltration and evaporation? Okay, I see. Different water. Okay, I I uh, I used the the uh, soil water characteristic curve to similar to the, uh, the infiltration, but uh, I don't think I I similar to the evaporation. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so you haven't took an account of evaporation. 
Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. True. Okay. Second question is: um, um, Do you have correlations between FOS against instability versus run out distance? Um, uh, actually, the fact of uh, stability only works for the pre-failure stage. So, uh, for the run out, so for the run out, uh, run out stage, so, so we we. Um, we didn't calculate the factor of stability. We only calculate uh, the factor of stability before the before the failure. Yeah. Then maybe one last question before we move on. What constitutive model was used? Was suction considered in the simulation? Yeah, the the the, the model is the more common model for the sliding mass, and uh, so in this case we. Entered the groundwater level in in the in the, in the model, so the section is considered in the simulation. Yes. Okay. So thank you very much once more, thank and you. then we will move on to the next presentation. The next presenter will be Luigi Pugliese from uh, the University of Calabria with the title Modeling of a Landslide in Sensitive Clays Using MPM. Luigi, you are there. Good morning. Already? Yes. Can, uh, can yeah, you hear me? We can hear you clear. Yes. And we can see your screen. Everything looks good. Okay. Do you see? Uh... Yes. Perfect. It's enlarged. So uh, yeah, okay. Yes. Right so uh, before starting, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to have this uh, presentation to this workshop. My name is Luigi Puyes, and I will present this uh, work entitled Modeling of a Landslide in Sensitive Clays Using MPM. Uh, in particular, in the present work, the material point method is employed to analyze a landslide that occurred in 2010 at St. Jude in Quebec, Canada, involving mainly a formation of sensitive clays. These soils may undergo a considerable reduction in strength when subjected to remolding, as occurs during uh, the run-out process of landslides. Uh, as a consequence, landslides involving very sensitive clays, often called quick clays, are generally characterized by a very high velocity and a very long run-out distance comparable to those experienced by lateral spreads due, due to liquefaction. For such landslides, most of, of the available papers focus only on the failure stage without paying attention to the post-failure analysis and to the prediction of, of the run-out distance. In this context, the main objective of, of the present study is the analysis of the deformation pro process, including the post-failure stage in the run-out distance and the kinematic behavior of the St. Jude slide by using the material point method along with a strain softening soil model. And for those who are interested in the bottom of this slide, I report the reference of a paper that we have recently published where you can find more details about the analysis that I will present in the following. The St. Jude landslide was triggered on 10 May 2010 by natural causes. In particular, it was triggered by the erosion produced by the Salvile River located at the base of the slope, along with the high pore water pressures acting within the slope. The subsoil of the St. Jude area is made up of three geological units denoted as Unit A, Unit B and Unit C. The shallowest one is Unit A, which can be classified as sudden sand from a geotechnical point of view. Unit B, whose thickness is approximately 22 meters, consists of a uniform sensitive clay with an overconsolidation ratio in the range between 1, 2 and 1, 9. And finally, uh, Unit C is a stiff clay of low sensitivity with a thickness of approximately 5 meters. The available piezometric measurements showed that the groundwater level is very close to the ground surface. The landslide involved only unit A and unit B and presented the typical features of a spread in sensitive clays. Referring to a representative section, the geotechnical model of the slope is presented in this figure, where the location of the failure surface is also indicated, along with the slope profile detected before and after the landslide. This figure also shows the observed displacement vectors of some benchmark points located on the original ground surface. Besides, the run-out distance of the landslide body is about 60 meters. 
Following the study by Locat et al. 2017, at the beginning of 2010, the slope under consideration was precariously stable with the value of the slope safety factor equal to one or three. During the spring of the same year, a soil volume at the base of the slope was removed by river erosion that in conjunction with the high pore water pressures existing in the slope triggered the landslide. After the landslide triggering, the post failure stage lasted a few minutes. Consequently, considering that the involved soils consist mainly of saturated clay, it's reasonable to assume that this process occurred under undrained conditions. In the present study, the deformation and failure mechanisms of the slope are analyzed using the material pen method. In particular, the analysis has been carried out using the one phase single point formulation implemented in the MPM code ANURA 3D. The analysis is performed under the, reason, the reasonable assumption of plane strain conditions. To this purpose, a computational mesh made up of triangular elements with an average element size of one meter and a half is employed. Failure developed in unit B that consists of a sensitive clay characterized by a strong reduction in shear strength due to remolding. In the present study, this behavior is simulated using an elastoplastic strain softening model in conjunction with the Tresca yield criterion using the equation shown in this slide with the involved parameters that are listed in the following. On the contrary, an elastic perfectly plastic model is employed for the other soils. In particular, the Tresca model is assumed for unit C, whereas the more Coulomb model is assumed for unit A. The values of the geotechnical parameters employed to perform the analysis are synthesized in this table. The well-known procedure of gravity loading was used to generate the initial stress state of the slope. And as the slope was marginally stable before the occurrence of the event, the gravity loading was generated under the assumption that all materials behave elastically to avoid any failure in this stage. After generating the initial uh, stress state of the slope, the triggering of the landslide was simulated by switching the behavior of the sensitive clay from linear elastic to elastoplastic with strain softening. And as a consequence uh, of the precarious stability condition of the slope, the material points moved, undergoing deviatoric plastic strains with a consequent reduction in the undrained strength of the sensitive clay. The simulation results are documented in the following slides. In particular, the final configuration of the landslide body obtained from the numerical simulation is shown in this figure along with a comparison with the slope profile detected before and after the landslide. As can be noted, the final profile of the slope is satisfactorily predicted by the numerical simulation. In particular, the runout distance, the deposition zone, and the depletion zone provided by the numerical simulation are close to those that really occurred. In addition, this figure also shows a comparison between the displacement vectors of some benchmark points observed in the field with those predicted by the material point method. And as can be seen, this comparison is also satisfactory. Uh, uh, besides, this slide reports an animation showing uh, the evolution of the material points during the post failure stage of the landslide. In addition, this figure shows the associated aviatoric strain field in order to define the location of the failure surface and the geometry of the stable soil mass provided by the numerical simulation. As can be seen, the simulation results are in good agreement with the uh, failure surface documented by Locat et al. Uh, besides, this figure shows the accumulated aviatoric strains at different times to highlight the development of the slip surface and its location within the slope. These results show that the deviatoric strains concentrate in shear zones, defining a failure mechanism formed by two failure surfaces. In particular, the first uh, surface starts near the riverbed and ends just uh, behind the existing building, in particular, refer to figure A. At the subsequent times, um, as shown in figure B and figure C, the unstable soil mass moves essentially as a translational slide along the failure surface, covering the riverbed and a portion of the opposite bank. While the accumulation zone increases, the depletion zone extends upstream, and the second failure surface develops at a higher elevation than the first surface, giving rise to the main scarp of the landslide, as shown in figure D. 
In other words, the movement occurs in two successive phases along two failure surfaces located at different elevations. And these results are in agreement with what was observed by Locat et al. Uh, finally, for the sake of completeness, the results of a parametric analysis performed on the influence of the shape factor lambda is shown in this slide. In particular, the values of uh, lambda indicated in, in this slide on the right are considered. This figure shows that there are now distance and the crown retreat increase with increasing lambda with the best results that are obtained uh, for a value of lambda equal to 50. In conclusion, the deformation processes occurring during the uh, failure and post-failure stages of the 2010s in Judland slide are analyzed using the material point method. The obtained results confirm the capability of the material point method in properly predicting the development of the failure surface within the slope and simulating the runout of the considerable slide under undrained conditions. In particular, although no restraint was previously imposed to the location of the slip surface, the predicted failure mechanism is very similar to that reconstructed in field. And finally, the obtained results show that the material point method is an attractive method for predicting successfully both the failure mechanism and the runout of landslides in very sensitive place, requiring also a limited number of conventional geotechnical parameters as input data. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Luigi. Yes. Let's move on to the questions. So we have some questions here. Um, I will read it out loud. As such, you did not model as triggering action any erosion portion, isn't it? So it's, I think uh, the yes, the erosion was modeled in a simplified way by switching the uh, constitutive model from the linear elastic uh, behavior in the gravity loading to the strain softening model, because actually uh, we don't know the uh, amount of soil that was eroded. Also in the study documented by Locat et al, the same authors uh, don't know the exact quantity of soil that was eroded. They just know that it was a very small quantity. So in a simplified way, we use this procedure to, to trigger the, the landslide. And then there's direct follow-up is that there were no permeability values presented. Uh, is that because you carried out an undrained analysis? Yes, exactly. We performed the um, analysis in terms of total stresses, and so we don't need the permeability. All right. So how much? Yeah, we still have time. Okay. Uh, next question. The reduction of the yield surface as a function of the strain is a key feature of the behavior of some iron tailings in Brazil. For example, the material stored in the Brumadino Dam. It would be useful to include friction angles simul uh, simultaneously. Would that create any numerical difficulty when compared to considering frictionless materials like Tresca material? Uh, can you please repeat? Because maybe I lost the connection for a second. And uh, the, so the, the, the question is if you could uh, um, if you could include uh, friction angles simultaneously in your simulation, and is there any difficulties in doing so with? No, we don't have any difficulties in including the friction angle. It's just that we perform the analysis in uh, undrained conditions, so we use the uh, Tresca model. So yeah, yeah. The, the parameter that we need in this uh, in this case is the uh, the undrained uh, strength. So actually, we use the friction angle, so because we use the uh, uh, more Coulomb model for unit A. So for another layer, we use the more Coulomb model and we employ the friction angle, but the uh, most of the landslide body is made up of unit B that is a sensitive play. And for this uh, this layer, we employ the, uh, the, the, Tresca, uh, the Tresca model. Yes. All right, next question is, what was the lambda, lambda in slide 16? <laughs> uh, the lambda, okay, yo, y yes, I will share another uh, yeah, we still have screen. A so do you see uh, again my yes, screen? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, lambda, uh, mm, yes, lambda is uh, this parameter. So it's a model parameter that controls the strength decrease rate that is required by this strain softening model that we employed. 
Okay, and the last one, then we can uh, start the last presentation. How do you obtain the material properties for the clay? Do you use uh, the matching between calculated and measured runouts? Um, how 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 we obtain which parameters for the clay? Uh, yes, actually, the parameters are documented in the papers by Locat et al. Mm -hmm. Because this is a well-known case study for which uh, there are actually several papers and all um, parameters that we need are uh, properly documented in this uh, in these papers. Okay, thank you very much. Then yeah. we move on to our last presentation of this section, and our last presenter is Meng Lu from the Tongji University in China. And his title of the presentation is a new strategy for the initialization of MPM simulations. Can, yes. can you hear? Yes, we can yes. hear you as okay. well. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. My voice and slide is okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Just just oh. maybe enlarge the presentation and then we can start. Yes. Thanks a yes. lot. Okay. Uh, thank you for organizers and uh, uh, from Alex's introduction. Uh, my name is Monglu a PhD candidate of uh, Tongji University and a collaborative PhD of uh, University of Padua. Uh, my talk today uh, is a new strategy for the initialization uh, of NPM simulation. Uh, I will introduce this content from four aspects. The first is the background. Uh, in reality, different geo hazards such as landslide, tunnel collapse, land subsidence, debris will occur. Uh, these geo hazards will threaten our uh, public safety. Simulating the large deformation of these geo hazards can help us to better understand them and reduce their impact. A material point method offers a powerful tool for large deformation simulations in geotechnical engineering. Uh, but to ensure the stability of a numerical uh, simulations, uh, it's widely used the uh, explicit algorithm. Uh, such algorithm also makes NPM efficient to simulate the long-term problems, such as the consolidations and seepage phases, such as the uh, rainfall-induced landslides. Yes. Uh, actually, for these long-term problems, uh, usually the simulation time is mainly consumed at the pre-failure stage. Uh, maybe only the post-failure stage uh, only lasts a few seconds. So to enhance the simulation efficiency, uh, maybe we can uh, improve the, efficient, uh, the simulation efficiency of the initialization of NPM analysis. So this study aims to exploit a new strategies uh, for the efficient initialization of NPM simulation. For the new strategy, it consists of two parts. In first parts, the initial conditions of NPM analysis uh, are generated with a more efficient method, such as the finite element method. Comparing with the NPM, FEM are usually implemented based on the implicit implicit algorithm is, is more efficient, but it has to solve large deformation because the mesh distortion. Then we can acquire a generic spatial distribution of a field variables, such as the porosity, pore pressure, stress, and strain. And in the second part, we can establish an NPM model with the same boundary conditions with a, uh, such as FEM model. And then we can use the mapping technique to map the field variables obtained from the previous analysis into the NPM model for the subsequent dynamic large displacement analysis. Uh, currently, the common interpolation technique, uh, such as including the Kriging interpolation, linear interpolation, and the kernel interpolation, uh, because uh, considering the convenience of application, as the pyramid of a kernel interpolation is easy to calibrate, so it's adopted in our study. The principle of a kernel interpolation is that the computational domain is decretized by representing the domain with 
a set of initial distribution of particles. In the domain, these particles have different weights. It is defined based on the kernel functions. There are two classical kernel functions. One is the cubic spline, and the second is the Gaussian uh, functions. We can see that from the cubic spline, it has a cut of distance. Uh, it's equal to the two times of smoothing length. Smoothing length is the parameters of the kernel functions. Beyond this range, uh, these particles are not used for prediction. And uh, comparing with cubic spline, Gaussian functions can consider all particles used for prediction. And then to predict the unknown points, we can use the middle equation to do that. Uh, we can see from this equation, uh, it's based on the known points close to the unknown points. More weights were given to the known points when it has a shorter distance from the unknown points. So we can use, based on these rules, we can use a kernel interpolation to predict any points in this domain. Uh, we can see that from this introduction, there is only one parameter in kernel uh, interpolation, that is a smoothing length, so it's very easy to calibrate. To show how to calibrate the smoothing length, we first use the soft Jaws Studio to establish the FEM model of block. The mesh size is equal to five meters, and the field variables here we use the pore pressure. After C page analysis, we can extract the pore pressures at each node. Then we can randomly select one node as the unknown point and use other nodes to predict that using the kernel interpolation. Then we can build the error functions between the FEM result and the predictor result based on the kernel functions, like the left functions, yes. And then when we minimize the error functions, we can obtain the optimum smoothing length. In this study, we use the global optimization technique simulated a nailing algorithm implemented in MATLAB to solve this error functions. It should be, should be noted that other algorithm can be also used. Then we can obtain uh, the optimum smoothing length for different kernel functions. For cubic spline, uh, the optimum smoothing length is equal to 5.07. And for Gaussian functions, it's equal to 4.17. Uh, especially, we can notice that for the cubic spline, the smoothing length is almost equal to the mesh size. This phenomenon will be explained and investigated later. After the calibration, uh, the, we need to check the accuracy. So the mesh size of the finite element model is changed to three meters and the pore pressure of the block at the new points is obtained. And then the pore pressures at these new points are also predict on the best of the kernel interpolation respectively with cubic spline and Gaussian functions. As shown in the left figures, we can notice that uh, these two sets of results almost fall at the 45 degrees line. The coefficients of determinations between these two sets of results is almost equal to one, indicating that, that the kernel interpolation with the cubic spline and the Gaussian functions both has the high accuracy. Usually, uh, if we use the different ways or different FEM models, uh, such as the uh, tools to obtain the initial distributions of field, field variables, uh, it may influence the calibration of smoothing length. So it's necessary to investigate the uh, effect of the initial distribution of field variables on smoothing lens. So we calibrate the smoothing lens uh, with different mesh size and type. Uh, we use two uh, mesh types. One is the triangle and another is a quadrangle. And we can notice that from these figures, there's an obviously linear relationship between the smoothing lens and, this, and the mesh size. Based on the investigation, we can find that the optimum smoothing length can be conveniently determined as the mesh size and type are given. 
so we can avoid the complicated calibration process, just uh, uh, directly use this uh, mesh size and type, type to obtain the uh, optimum smoothing length. With the cubic spline functions, we can consider that the optimum smoothing length is between the 0 0.7 and the one times of reference distance between two observed points. We implemented the suggested strategies in the open source on Neural 3D. The procedures is activated in CPS file using the keyword of the initialization from file. It has two properties. One property is control the switch and turn it on and off. And the second is control the uh, size of the smoothing lens. It's, it's, it's defined as the smoothing lens factor. This value can be given by the uh, previous investigation based on the mesh size. So users need to prepare the uh, file with the extension of the MAPF. This file including the coordinates and uh, you want to map the field variables and the mesh size. The mapping works for the 2D and 3D with the single point one phase and two phase framework. So next step, we need to validate our suggested strategy. We use the case of an experimental rainfall induced landslide presented in Laurel et al. 2016 in University of Padua. Assuming the right figures, we can see that the experimental slope consists of two layers. One is sand and another is clay. Because the clay is uh, impermeable, so it's considered as the base. Artificial rainfall with a steady intensity of 150 meters per hour was applied on the slope surface until the silty sand layer collapsed. During the hook collapse, the displacement of the slope is monitored by camera and the displacement vectors extracted based on PIV. PIV is a technique of uh, image recognition. Then referring to Laura et al, uh, we can obtain the soil parameters, which will be used in our simulations. Here, the, for the hydraulic model, we use the VG model. For the constitutive model, we use the elastoplastic plastic and the more columnophilia criteria. First, we need to estimate the failure time. Uh, that is the initial conditions of NPM analysis. We use, also use the FEM software, Joe Studio, to build the FEM model. I, as we can see that we use a CPHW, a CPW to for the, is used for the CPH analysis and slope W is used for the FOS calculations. The bottom and the left side of the slope is set as the impermeable boundary and the right side is set as the potential CPH surface. And the flux boundary is applied on the slope surface to model the rainfall infiltration. Based on this FEM model, uh, we can obtain the any times during the uh, rainfall. Uh, we can calculate the slope FOS. Based on the change of FOS with time, we can judge that when the FOS is close to one, we can judge such time as the failure time of the slope. Then we can obtain the pop pressure, stress, and other field uh, variables uh, as the initial conditions of MPM model. Uh, we can see that the most critical slip surface goes through the whole slope body. In the experiment, the infiltration process involved for more than 1.5 hours and the failure occurred suddenly without any warning signs. So it has a good agreement with our simulation. So next, we will using the kernel interpolation. The pop pressure and the total stress obtained from the FEM model is mapped into the MPM model. Uh, it should be, should be noted that uh, here, because the FEM model has a very small displacement, is uh, neglected in our uh, MPM analysis. It means that uh, the initial displacement of FP model is equal to zero. And the hydraulic boundary is same with the FEM model. 
and the constitutive model and hydraulic model is the same. We can see that from the right figures, uh, it shows the power pressure, total stress, and the effective stress of the MPL model. Based on the Onerous 3D platform, we can analyze the post failure uh, of the slope. We extracted uh, its displacement vectors from the simulations. And based on the kinetic energy, uh, we can see that the balance of the slope is re established uh, in 1.5 seconds. So based on the final displacement vectors, uh, comparing the uh, experimental result and the simulation result, we can find that uh, there is a relative good agreement between exper experiments and simulations, proving that the validity of the proposed strategy. Okay, finally, the concluding remarks are given. Uh, this study proposed a general and a practical strategy for the initialization of NPM simulations to improve the computation no efficiency is a mapping technique implemented based on the kernel interpolation and also incorporated into the open software on Neural 3D. The strategies is used to simulate experimental rainfall induced landslide, coupling the FEM and MPM analysis. Uh, we can find that it has a good agreement between the experimental and the simulation results. That's all my presentation. Thank you for listening. Welcome and question. Thank you very much. Um, let's see, we are actually like now just going into a break. So like for those of you who want to make a break now, we will continue at half past one. And those which want to join the discussion now, uh, just stay tuned. So there's a question for you. And um, I will just read it out. I haven't read it yet. By using this process, is in principle possible to see to use sigma which is the fe code of yield studies for soil stress analysis to initialize the stresses vertical and horizontal as well as pore water pressures in the mpm model uh, yeah so okay i i need to check yes mm. Passport in sigma to initialize stress. Uh, yes, uh, because here we use uh, NPM uh, code. Uh, it's based on the, uh, for the unsaturated problems, it depends on the effective stress. So we also map the uh, total stress and into the model and the uh, pressure into that we can based on the unsaturated constitutive model to calculate uh, automatically the stress in NPM model, yes. Uh, if I can add something, um, we imported uh, total stress and pore pressure and they can be generated with uh, any software you like. We actually also use the uh, Sigma W uh, in addition to C for the total stress, but we also tried other programs, for example, Midas, Plaxis and others. And this feature is not yet available in uh, Anura 3D 2023, but it will be available uh, for sure next year. Um, we are trying to do some more testing and uh, generalization. Okay, so Esther, no further questions. I would like to close the session and maybe Leave the word to Francesca. Maybe you can like show us the program. Yes, I will show you the program again. Uh, so we um, have a half an hour break. We are five minutes late, but uh, uh, I think that uh, since it is online, uh, it's not really a problem uh, if we um, start at uh, 35. What do you think? Yeah, I, th I think that's fine. One thirty-five. Yeah. Okay. So I will leave this uh, slide here. Okay. And uh, I will put. Uh, yes, we will be.
five minutes late, but I don't think is a problem, right? Yes, but let's keep it this way and everyone can have okay. a little break. <laughs> Good. And thank you, everybody. Let's see you in half an hour. Enjoy your lunch break. <laughs> or dinner or breakfast. Depends. Through, through that. <laughs> Welcome back to the to the Anura 3D workshop. Uh, my name is Gaia Di Carluccio from uh, Polytechnic University of Catalonia, and I'm with my colleague Pietro Marveggio from uh, uh, Polytechnic of Milan. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So um, now in this presentation, we are going to present the new release of the Anura 3D version 2023. We're going to show you how to download Anura 3D and where to find the code, how to run uh, calculations. Sorry to interrupt, but this, this is, I cannot see the presentation view. Gaia, oh. can you uh, top middle option? No, okay. Yeah, now. Yeah, Sorry. okay. Thank you, Alba. Uh, so, yes, we are going to explain how to download Anura 3D, how to run a calculation. We briefly described the problem type version 2023 and also uh, additional documentation that you can find on our website. Sorry, it's a bit slow. Okay, so oh, the Anura 3D software can be downloaded from uh, the GitHub page. In particular, you, the Anura 3D pack include the source code. Um, so the source files are programmed in Fortran and they need to be compiled to, to get the Anura 3D executable and the dynamic libraries of the constitutive model that are um, available for solid and, uh, and fluid. And to do that, you need to uh, install two further software that are the Visual Studio Community and the One AP Toolkit as an Intel Fortran compiler. And remember that you can also use your own material model. In fact, Anura 3D uses the UMAT format for the use of external constitutive models as dynamic libraries. And the pack includes also the problem type which is a set of files that you need in the pre-processing phase to generate the input files for the calculation with Anura 3D. Performing a numerical simulation with Anura 3D consists of three parts. First, in the pre-processing phase, you need to create the input data. So in this phase, you need to define the uh, geometry of the model, the boundary conditions, the computational mesh, and this can be done with the GID software. In particular, the input data are mainly two text files. There are the CPS and GOM that we'll see later. The calculation is performed in Anura 3D. And finally, the post-processing phase allows us to visualize the results, and this can be done with two software, the Paraview and GID. So oh, let's start from the pre-processing. Uh, we recommend to use the GID software. And um, uh, first, the Anura 3D problem type has to be included in the GID software to use them. In particular, first, you should copy the uh, executable of Anura 3D and the dynamic libraries of the constitutive models in inside the, the Anura 3D problem type and then copy all this folder inside the problem types folder of GID on your, on, on your laptop. Git is a user-friendly pre and post processor. 
so once uh, imported the problem type inside GID, uh, you will be able to visualize the ANURA 3D interface. And in particular, the main novelty of this release is the interface in GID. In fact, we convert uh, our old problem type to the last version of GID problem type. Uh, so now it consists in a data tree menu where all the available features are, are listed. And differently from the uh, previous version, first the user should select the dimension of the, of the model. If it is a 2D plane strain or axisymmetric or a 3D model uh, Cartesian or um, cylindrical. And uh, once, um, once selected the, the proper option, then all the uh, data tree uh, is going to update um, to allow the user to assign the boundary condition on the corresponding entities. In the sense that if your model is a 2D model, for example, the materials can be assigned only on surfaces and the boundary condition only on lines. If your model is a 3D, the materials can be assigned only on volumes and uh, fixities on uh, surfaces. And also in the first, um, uh, as a, at the beginning, before creating your model, um, you should select the MPM discretization type. So the single point or the double point formulation. And the next step is to define all the material that you are going to use in the model, but at this stage, not to assign it. And um, uh, we will see how to assign a material uh, soon. And uh, as in the previous version, the interface is prepared to uh, let uh, the user to select the option of external material model and to assign the external material soil parameters. Then once defined the material properties, they can be assigned to surfaces or volumes depending on the dimension of the model together with the um, number of material points per element and the material viscous damping. So in this new version, you should assign all these uh, variables at the same time, in the same stage, and using the option material point specification. And the other conditions can be assigned, can be found in the menu under boundary or initial conditions, and also the other feature. Um, so once you create your model, JIT preprocessor generates the input files, that are mainly the text file with the extension GOM that describes the geometry, uh, all the information regarding the dimension, the boundary conditions, the materials that are assigned, and the CPS file uh, that includes all the calculation data, so the number of load steps, the duration of the steps, the uh, loading type, um, the calculation data, uh, now um, they can be assigned in the, in the same data tree menu. And to generate the input files for Anura 3D, you just click on the generate Anura 3D files on the top bar menu. And uh, so these files will be stored in the project directory. The calculation can be run from the project folder in which are included the uh, material models, so the dynamic libraries. And if you want to use your own material model, you should copy the DLL inside the project folder um, together with the executable and also the two input files generated by GID. Um, then Anura 3D um, can be executed, executed from the Windows command line or by running the calculate.bat file in the project folder. And the post-processing phase uh, allow us to visualize the results. This can be done with the Paraview, um, since Anura 3D stores most of the output information in a set of files with a BTK extension that can be read by Paraview. Also, um, uh, Anura 3D can provide as output further text file as the a file with the extension PAR that stores data from a given material point, ENG, that store information about the kinetic energy, internal work, uh, the time step information, or the MLG that stores the bulk information. And as an alternative, is it possible to visualize the results with GID? 
and the output can be generated in two formats. There are the binary format, format files, one file for each, for each uh, calculation step, or the ASCII format file. Um, so in this case, uh, we will have one file for the computational mesh and one for the results. Um, on the Anula 3D website, you can also find additional information and additional documentation. Uh, for example, the manuals and the video tutorial. In particular, the tutorial manual, um, in the tutorial manual, you can find useful information about how to compile uh, the code, which are the recommended software for the pre and post processing. Um, also, are highlighted the limitation and uh, some warnings. So, uh, you can find uh, all the features that are currently available and if they are um, tested or under development. And uh, from chapter three to 10, you can find practical um, uh, examples with step-by-step -step, um, instruction. Um, and some of these practical examples are also included in our YouTube channel when, where, where we upload video tutorials for the simulation of different uh, problems. Uh, you can find also video uh, regarding how to download and compile the code, an overview of the calculation process. And soon we are going to upload the video tutorials with the updated problem type. And so that's all and thank you for your attention. If you have a question, we are here. Maybe we can share, we will share in the chat uh, the website uh, so you can, uh, you have direct access to GitHub, have a look at, at our page. Uh, we will also include the news uh, from the community. Uh, you, well, today you had the possibility to see some of us. Okay, Alba, Alba just did it. Thank you, Alba. Uh, Oh, probably not all of you will see the. Okay. Okay. We just make sure that everybody. There is a question in. Yeah. Okay. So, what yes. kind of updates on inflow and outflow boundary condition are waiting for us in the new version? <laughs> uh, we. Actually, we don't have. No, we don't have. No, no, not, no date. not at this version. But uh, we we are planning to to have in the next one. Uh, if they have suggestions. <laughs> well, you can, <laughs> you can you uh, can you can uh, suggest us. Uh, uh, I mean, which are the um, which are yes, the. I mean, if you need some special uh, features for your research, for example. Yeah, you can either uh, participate in developing it, or if you have just ideas, uh, uh, then we can uh, we can uh, try to to de develop them. And at least if you don't know how to code, you will you can support the community even by preparing some uh, uh, benchmarks uh, that we, that if you if you want you, if you want you can share with us, and that would be helpful anyway. So. Uh, that's the best way to get in touch with us uh, and then maybe starting uh, participating in the code development. There is another question about seismic loading as well. Uh, uh, yes, I, I think that the seismic loading well, uh, is not included in the current release of the, of the code. There are people in uh, in the community working on that in uh, in its own uh, version of the of the code, but uh, I, if we plan to include it in the in the next release, then we are going to uh, update at the same time also the GID interface to to be able to apply these conditions. So, yes. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Pietro and, and Gaia for. Uh, letting us know about the new problem type. Yeah, we just have a few more questions. Just I know we are running out of time, but probably we can address them. 
uh, so we can answer in the chat yeah, and okay. hope it's better. Uh, one is one is very general. One is very general, so I want to answer everybody. You don't need to pay a premium version of EID. You can use uh, the the free one. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, uh, including, uh, just by like copying and pasting our problem type folder inside the the, the installation. So in, inside the installation folder. So yeah, it's open to every everyone. Okay. What about doing uh, state construction uh, manually in the GOM file? Uh, yes, I mean, um, uh, yes, the state later, I mean, in this session, in the next one, there will be a presenter talking about the construction. And uh, yes, I think that we're going to include it in the next release. And so currently, there's not this option. And Okay. Just make sure, uh, everybody, just make sure to uh, have a look at the chat where Alba just uh, shared the links and you can participate. Uh, uh, I mean, you can find the information and uh, as well, you can participate to the discussion, which is open. So, uh, yeah, you can be helpful. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Uh, now we are going to start the second session of. Uh, presentations and I'd like to invite to Maria Mandalari who is going to uh, first talk about ambient simulation of the impact of debris flows on earth reinforced walls and just uh -huh. to remind uh, all speakers on this session uh, each uh, speaker will have about 15 minutes in total but remember to uh, leave a little bit of time for questions okay and yeah. hello can you hear me yeah I can hear you can you see my screen? Okay. So hello everyone. I am Maria Mandalari and I'm a PhD student at Mediterranea University of Reggio Calabria. And today I will present uh, the result of my research regarding NPM simulation of the impact of the breeze flow on earth reinforced wall. In fact, the aim of the research is to uh, examine the dynamics of the impact, evaluate the impact force evolution, and define the key parameters affecting the impact and exploring the behavior of sliding barriers in order to better understand the phenomena so that mitigation measures can be designed in the best way possible. Debris flow were defined by Jung as a very rapid to extremely rapid flow of saturated debris in a steep channel. So uh, they are classified as the rapid kinematic landslide, and this combined uh, with the large deformations of the mass uh, makes them a uh, high destructive phenomena. The model used in the simulation is based on a triangular mesh, while the continuum is represented by a barrier, which is uh, uh, modeled as a rigid body, both in a moving and a fixed condition. It was considered a variation in the inclination of the face of the barrier. And in the case of the moving uh, barrier, it was considered a basal friction of 24 degrees. In this case, it was also um, considered a new code in order to evaluate the displacement of uh, the rigid body. While the debris flow was modeled was an, as an equivalent fluid, using uh, Bingham rheology. The flow was placed attached to the barrier with uh, an initial velocity of 8.8 meters per second. Uh, we also uh, can notice that we didn't consider it a foundation. In fact, uh, we uh, carried out a series of simulation both with and without foundation, but we noticed that the model without foundation had the less uh, numerical problem in terms of the uh, instability of the material points of the foundation. So uh, the general equation of the Bingham model is uh, reported in this um, slide. The stress is the sum of the yield stress and a term dependent on the Bingham viscosity. When the stress reaches the, the heel condition, the material begins to flow, while in the other case, the material behaves as a Newtonian flow. As it concerns the contact properties, the contact between the flow and barrier was based on the already present algorithm based on the formulation of Ardenagen, while the contact between a rigid barrier and the base was new. 
It was based on uh, the equation, uh, equilibrium equation of the forces uh, on a rigid body. But we have to check if the uh, body is moving or not. So if the velocity is lower than a tolerance, the barrier is not moving. And we have to check is the, uh, if the external forces are uh, lower than the frictional maximum force at the base of the barrier. If it is so, then the friction, uh, friction at the sliding base is equal to a, <clears throat> the external force. Otherwise, it is equal to the static coefficient multiplied by the reaction, vertical reaction force at the base of the barrier. Why, if the barrier is moving, so the velocity is higher than the tolerance, the friction at the, at the sliding base is equal to the dynamic coefficient multiplied by the vertical reaction force at the base of the barrier. This new algorithm was validated with a benchmark problem uh, characterized by a rigid sliding block pushed by an horizontal force increasing linearly. In this case, we can see in the graph at the right that the uh, displacement calculated uh, with NPM, which is uh, represented by the red dot line, is equivalent to the analytical displacement, which is represented by the black line, which was calculated through Newmark's uh, equation. This is an example of the simulation in the case of the fixed barrier. So the flow impact against the barrier, uh, there is the formation of a vertical jet-like wave which fall on itself, while the other part of the material uh, points overflow uh, the barrier. We also consider the case of the sliding barrier. The behavior of the flow is uh, equal to the uh, previous case, but in this case, the uh, barrier began to move when the uh, impact force exceeded the frictional maximum force at the base of the barrier. As we can see uh, from the initial condition, which is that represented by this uh, um, black shape. So uh, the impact force can be divided in, in this case into two components, an horizontal and a vertical one. Both uh, can be, uh, uh, we can notice that uh, they have a three uh, peak value. The first peak, which is indicative of the first impact. The second peak, uh, which um, is uh, due to the flow that totally covers the face of the barrier, while the third peak, which is greater than the previous one, was caused by the um, fall of the vertical jet lag wave on itself. We also made a comparison between uh, the uh, impact force, uh, the horizontal impact force, the frictional maximum force at the base of the barrier, the displacement and velocity obtained from MPM. We can see that when the force, impact force exceeds the frictional maximum force at the base of the barrier, the velocity and displacement uh, uh, increase while when the force decreases, also the velocity decreases, while the slope of the displacement, as we can see in this part of the graph, of the graph um, decreases. When the force increases again, also the velocity increases and the um, slope of the curve displacement. When the uh, velocity nullifies, the barrier long, no longer displays, so the displacement is constant. We also made a comparison um, between the results obtained from NPM and the analytical uh, displacement and velocity obtained from a uh, Newmark's equation. And we can see that uh, the, um, both the, result, the curve are in good agreement between the two cases. In fact, both the curve coincides less than a small error, which was due to force approximation. We also plotted the pressure distribution uh, along the height of the barrier in uh, the case of the first impact, the second impact, third impact, and then uh, an envelope of the maximum force on every strip. In fact, we divided uh, the um, uh, barrier into uh, 10 strip, uh, 60 centimeter high. We can see that the pressure distribution is almost linear up to half uh, the height of the barrier, such as a nature static distribution, while in the other part of the height, it is almost constant, such as a nature dynamic distribution. Uh, at least we uh, made a comparison comparison between uh, the impact first in the case of the fixed and sliding barrier. 
So uh, we can see from this graph that uh, the um, sliding capacity of the barrier results in a damping of the total impact force. However, the uh, first and the second peak remain unchanged. At the end, we made a series of parametric parametric analysis in order to see the influence of viscosity, barrier phase inclination, flow velocity, and bulk modulus on the impact force. So we noticed that the impact force is higher uh, with the, uh, when the inclination of the phase increases. So we can see that the uh, blue line, which represents uh, an angle in of inclination of 70 degrees, is higher than the other case, which are uh, re the red line, the 70 de uh, 60 degrees and 45 degrees. While the dynamic viscosity does not affect significantly the impact force, but we notice that for higher values of the viscosity, the simulation are more uh, stable. And this happens also with the flow velocity. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, when the uh, velocity rises, the uh, model becomes more unstable, but we can see that the impact force increases uh, with velocity. For what it concerns bulk modulus, uh, we notice that for higher values of uh, the bulk modulus, the curve is shifted towards shorter time. But if we analyze the two trends of the, um, uh, of the force impact force, we notice that the two the curve with higher values of k is more irregular, but the two trends doesn't differ significantly from each other. So in conclusion, uh, we can see that uh, through this simulation, we are able to simulate the impact process, registering the time history of impact forces. We can also identify three peaks in the uh, evolution of the force and the corresponding pressure distribution of the, ba on the barrier. We can consider in the sliding at the base of the barrier, but it doesn't seem to affect the maximum impact forces. And we carried out a series of parametrical analysis that show that the key parameters for impact forces are the geometry of the barrier and the flow and the impact velocity. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Maria. And I think we still have a couple minutes for questions. So if you have questions, please. Uh, put them in the chat. And there is a question. Uh, to obtain the pressure distribution, did you plot the stresses from the material points of the soil impacting barrier, or you plotted the function of ANURA to measure reaction forces at different segments? Yeah, I measured the, the forces at the different strips of the barrier. And then from the forces, I calculated the pressure on every strips. I do have another question. So uh, you have like a mesh and the bottom part of the mesh is also empty. Is there any reason for that or? Uh, uh, no, it, it was also the images uh, which was clear, uh, but uh, we have uh, um, high, um, a dom domain which was um, um, greater than that represented with uh, only with a triangular mesh. But we uh, didn't consider a foundation or it was empty, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria, for your presentation. And I think we can proceed to the next one. It's going to give, be given by Angela Di Perna. And the title of the presentation is NPM-based class A prediction results for single and dual rigid and flexible partners. Uh, yeah. Um, so I share my screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, can you see the screen? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. We oh, can yeah. See. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So, um, so I have some troubles here. Okay. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Angela Di Perna and uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at uh, the University of Salerno in Italy. The work that uh, I'm going to show you was made in collaboration with uh, Professor Sabatino Cuomo and Dr. Mario Martinelli. 
The study regards the MPM based class A prediction results for a single and dual rigid and flexible barriers. Uh, here we have an overview of the presentation. After a brief introduction, I'll show you the, ex the experimental setup and the MPM modeling. Uh, then we have a comparison of results and finally the concluding remark. Uh, so, uh, the initiative was organized by Professor Charles Ng from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Uh, the, class, the Class A prediction involved uh, four experiments carried out in a channel uh, 28 meter long, uh, heavily instrumented and equipped with one or two barriers, uh, rigid or flexible, uh, impacted from a mass of saturated granular soil. According to Lamb, uh, a class A predictions are made before an event, and they are most useful for assessing the re reliability of uh, existing tools for debris flow hazard mitigation. Out of more than 250 uh, were registered at the event, uh, and uh, 15 groups uh, joined the, the Class A prediction, and only nine groups uh, answered to all the questions, uh, which concerns both uh, the propagation of the flow and the mechanisms uh, of interaction with the barriers. Uh, in particular, uh, our group uh, was placed among the winners. Uh, so, uh, the tests uh, were conducted in a 28 meter long uh, flume located in Hong Kong. Uh, okay. uh, so, uh, we have an inclined storage container with a capacity up to 9, meter, nine uh, cubic meter uh, of debris material, and uh, this is set at uh, the upstream dam end of the flume. Uh, the flume has uh, a uniform uh, rectangular cl cross section, uh, which is uh, two meter wide. Uh, the transportation channel is inclined at uh, 20 uh, degrees, and after we have uh, an horizontal runout section uh, measuring uh, 4.2 meter in length. Uh, the first barrier. Uh, uh, the first barrier uh, is uh, 0 0.8 meter high, and uh, is, it is situated six meter from the gate, while uh, the second barrier is located at the end of uh, the runout section. Uh, the tests were conducted also with uh, dual flexible barriers. Uh, we have a first barrier um, 0 0.0 meter high, and the second barrier, uh, 1.5 meter high. Uh, this barrier was uh, also equipped with the three brake elements, uh, and uh, in general, all the flume is uh, heavily uh, equipped with uh, five load cells along the, the flume, uh, four high speed cameras, uh, etc. Uh, so, uh, the given data were uh, the problem geometry, uh, the grain side distribution of the debris, the volumetric water content, the density of the mixture, the internal friction angle, and also the interface friction angle. But uh, the asked output were the total flow duration, the peak impact force, the maximum run up height, which is this one. Uh, the maximum overflow distance, which is this, uh, the landing angle, uh, the debris retained by, uh, behind the barrier, and the maximum barrier deflection in case of uh, flexible barriers. Uh, at the, load, at uh, the locations of uh, load cells, uh, the asked output were the flow depth, uh, flow front velocity, uh, basal normal force, uh, basal shear force and basal per water pressure. 
so the material point method allows to simulate multi-phase materials using different approaches. Uh, in our analysis, we perform both one-phase and two-phase single point formulation. Uh, we compare uh, the results to assess the spatio-temporal variation of uh, pore water pressure during the process. And uh, we use all the results to evaluate the results uncertainty. Uh, as well known, pore water pressure highly controls both the prof propagation and landslide structure interaction. Therefore, a uh, two phase approach is preferable. Uh, the numerical uh, analysis were conducted with a version of a NURA 3D code developed by Deltares. The numerical model was made by a computational mesh with quadrilateral elements with an average size of 0.1 meter. Uh, the contact between the, uh, the bodies, uh, uh, such as the flow and uh, the flume, uh, the flow and the barriers, uh, is handled with a frictional contact al algorithm. Uh, this contact uh, cannot be applied along the flexible barriers. Uh, therefore, the flow barrier interface here is uh, perfectly rough and permeable. Uh, the internal strength of the, the debris was described using an elastoplastic constitutive model with an internal friction angle of uh, 15 degrees for the total stress analysis. And in the in the range between 20 and 30 degrees for the two-phase analysis. Uh, here we can see the animation of the results in terms of uh, velocity for the rigid barrier setup. Um, we can see that uh, the run-up uh, heights um, uh, are uh, very high in the case of uh, two-phase model confirming that uh, excess per pressure favors the run-up mechanism of the flow during the impact. Uh, this happens also for the flexible barrier setup, where both barrier deflection and run-up heights are much higher uh, for the two-phase uh, model than the one-phase model. Uh, the difference between one-phase and two-phase model can be understood in terms of uh, RU factor, uh, that is the ratio between uh, per water pressure and total stress. Uh, in the, in the two-phase analysis, uh, the factor RU is about, uh, uh, sorry, in the one-phase analysis, the factor RU is about 0.4 and it is constant during the analysis. In the two-phase analysis, uh, RU is a uh, compute uh, uh, during time. Uh, so we can see that uh, the factor in, uh, in the load cell C1 is lower in the two-phase uh, analysis compared to the one-phase uh, analysis. Uh, then it reaches a peak in correspondence of the load cell C2 and remains quite constant for the rigid barrier setup. While for the flexible barriers setup, we have that the cells number three, four, and five um, are, uh, have uh, a factor RU quite similar to the uh, one phase uh, uh, factor. Uh, so here we made a comparison between the prediction results and the experimental ones in correspondence of the load cells located along the flume. Uh, we can see a general agreement of the results, especially for flow depth and velocity, uh, while the basal pore water pressure reaches very high values in some cases. Here. Yeah. Uh, here we made a comparison between the prediction results and the experimental ones in correspondence of the impact between the flow and the barriers. Uh, we can see a general agreement for the results of rigid barriers, uh, even if the impact force is in general underestimated. 
However, some problem uh, arise for assessing the maximum overflow distance and the run up height. So in conclusion, uh, CLESI prediction results show that uh, MPM is a promising tool for assessing landslide structure interaction problems. Uh, flow kinematics is also well captured by the model. Anyway, there were some issues in measuring some quantities because of flow landing turbulence uh, during the experiments. Uh, therefore, the measurements are affected by large uncertainty. Uh, more efforts are needed for properly simulating the interaction against flexible barriers. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Angela. And we do have time for questions. I will ask one uh, first. So you are measuring pore pressure, at, I'm guessing kind of in an Eulerian fashion at the nodes, or is uh, how, how are you measuring the pore pressure from the model? Uh, well, I measure forward pressure uh, along uh, um, along a fixed uh, surface. Uh, so I I choose uh, a line for which uh, I want the output. And uh, there uh, I give I obtained the, the output of uh, for water pressure. And my follow question is, um, how do you handle poor water pressure oscillations if there are any on your model due to instabilities or numerical instabilities or something related to integration methods? Um, no, poor. Uh, sorry, I didn't understand. So in, in your solution, uh, uh, I'm yeah. guessing you're solving a... Uh, yeah, two-phase model, two -phase single model point. And, yeah. and usually, depending on, I guess, integration scheme, uh, ah, yeah. it happens that yeah, we... pressure oscillates a little bit. So my question is, how that affected that measurement of pore pressure for your comparison? Yeah, uh, uh, we noticed that using uh, quadrilateral elements, so four noded elements, uh, and and therefore BMR, B, uh, bar method for uh, um, algorithm, uh, we we obtained more stable per water pressure instead of triangular mesh and uh, so the classical uh, garlic method, and that. Thank you. There is another question. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. It says, can we consider uh, Gabion's wall as a rigid or flexid wall? I think it's a question. And is it possible to consider the destruction of this kind of wall? I guess like a mm -hmm. kind of fracture, I'm guessing what the, the yeah, question yeah. is. It's a wrong. good question. Yeah, I think uh, uh, not flexid, flexible like uh, these barriers that I show, but uh, I think uh, the material uh, has to be as uh, uh, yeah, has to be permeable, so we don't have uh, contact between flow and gabions. And also the gabions uh, has to have <laughs> uh, uh, their, uh, their own uh, constitutive model for uh, uh, for simulate the deformation and the destruction. Okay, thank you okay. so much, Angela. Very nice presentation. Okay. Thank you, too. And uh, the next speaker is Matteo Servi, and the title of his presentation is Rock Blocks Impacting on Granular Soil, MPM Numerical Analysis. All yours, Matteo. Good afternoon. Thank you, Luis. Can you see my screen? Yes. So good afternoon. I am Matteo Zerbi, a PhD student from Politecnico di Milano. And today I will present you a work that uh, we are currently developing at uh, Politecnico di Milano about the numerical simulation of the impact between rock blocks and uh, granular strata. Sheltering galleries are uh, protection structures that are commonly built to protect infrastructures and structures 
from uh, the impact of uh, rock blocks. They are made of a reinforced concrete structure over which is built, uh, is uh, realized a granular strata. This strata has the function to avoid the direct impact between the block and the reinforced concrete structures and to allow the dissipation of the impact energy. To correctly design this kind of structure, fundamental is the assessment of the impact force and uh, the block penetration inside the granular stratum. So we have uh, tried to see if, if we can numerically predict these, uh, two, these two things. We have started by studying the problem of the vertical impact of a spherical block on an horizontal stratum, because for this kind of problem, we have uh, uh, large scale test results. And so we can compare our uh, numerical prediction with uh, large scale test data. And also because we can uh, exploit the axis symmetry of the problem. Of course, this is a large uh, displacement problem. And so we have to, we have chosen to use the material point method and in particular the code ANURA 3D. And take into account that uh, this problem involves large stresses and large strain rates. For uh, the granular stratum, we have considered a recently conceived uh, constitutive model, the multi regime model proposed by Marvejo et al., and uh, modified to take into account of the large stresses. This is our numerical model. The free fall phase of the block is not simulated. So the block is generated just over the granular strata, stratum with uh, an initial velocity that is function of the expected falling height. The, rigid, the block is modeled as a rigid body, whereas as I've already mentioned for the granular stratum, the multi-regime model is employed. A frictional contact is introduced between the block and the stratum. And uh, the moving mesh feature uh, already implemented in Aura 3D is used. This is an overview of the constitutive model that we have used. Uh, according to the multi regime model, the stress is, sum as the sum, is seen as the sum of the two contributions. The, the first one is the contribution of enduring frictional contact. So for chains, that is modeled as an elastic plastic constitutive law, whereas the, the second contribution is the one associated with the instantaneous inelastic collision between particles that is modeled according to the kinetic theories of granular gases and introduces in the model the dependence on the state variable uh, granular temperature. Depending on which each of these two contribution prevails, the behavior of the granular material is uh, more similar to that of a fluid or to that of a solid. And so this constitutive model is uh, particularly suitable for uh, studying a large uh, strain rates problem as uh, impact problems are. We have uh, modified the original formulation of a constitutive model to take into account of particle damaging. And in particular, we have modified the shape of the critical state locus and the hydrotropic hardening rule. These are, uh, the, this is the comparison between uh, our numerical uh, results and uh, the experimental data obtained by Carvet and Prisco for uh, large scale test of uh, vertical impacts on this dense strata. In particular, we have compared the, the impact force and the block displacement and their temporal evolution. As is evident, the comparison is uh, very satisfactory, testifying the capability of our uh, numerical tool to satisfactory predict uh, the impact. These are two impact associated with uh, two different falling heights. These are uh, the, the, in this slide, the comparison is reported for uh, both the maximum impact force and uh, the maximum block penetration. And uh, as is evident, the comparison is uh, satisfactory for uh, all uh, the, the different falling height uh, considered. 
The use of uh, this numerical tool has allowed also us to identify the propagation of a compression wave inside the granular mass, which induces the, um, the compaction of the material under the penetrating block, whereas on uh, laterally we observe a dilatation. The study of the propagation of the compression wave is uh, fundamental if in the future we want to study also the dynamic interaction with the underlying structure that until now is not considered. And uh, using the post processor, we have also identified which is uh, the collapse mechanism under the penetrating block that is uh, associated with uh, a lateral upward movement of, uh, of the soil. All the three figures are reported at the peak of the impact force. To further uh, validate our results and to assess the reliability of our results, we have performed some impact tests also on loose strata. In this case, we have uh, compared our numerical results with uh, the empirical formula that is commonly used to estimate the depth of the improved and uh, compacted zone. And uh, as we can see, the, the comparison between our uh, numerical results and the prediction of the empirical formula is quite satisfactory, testifying that uh, our numerical uh, model is not able to reproduce only block kinematics uh, but also the, the modification in the, in the state that occurs in the, in the granular stratum. I have concluded. So the, according to me, this work has testified the capability of the code Anura 3D with implemented an advanced constitutive model to reproduce the complex dynamic interaction between uh, spherical rock blocks with uh, dense and loose strata. And in future developments, we will use also the feature of absorbing boundaries that is already available in Anura 3D. And uh, we'll study inclined impacts and impacts on uh, saturated strata using a two-point formulation. And also we will, we will uh, couple our analysis with the study of the interaction with the underlying structure. So I have concluded. Thanks for your attention. And I'm available if there are questions. Thank you so much, Matteo. Uh, so we do have time for questions. I have one and it's related to the um, meshing up or the geometry of the impacting body. So it's a, a sphere, right? And yes. did you have any problem simulating like the perfect shape of the sphere of the contact? Because usually um, that will generate say a little, little, uh, triangular element between the sphere and the soil. Did, what do you do to, to handle that? Yes, uh, I have uh, a lot of problems with uh, uh, this topic, but uh, we decided to continue with the simulation of a spherical boulder because we have data on, uh, on, on uh, we have the experimental data on uh, spherical boulder. And to, I've performed uh, different uh, sensitivity analysis to assess that they have not dependence on the mesh results. And in particular, in, uh, in the preprocessor Git, I've used an unstructured mesh. And after the, the Git has generated the mesh, I have uh, split the elements that are uh, at the, under the, the sphere and the on the lateral to, to have a lot of elements in, in this zone because uh, it's fundamental to have a lot of and small elements in this region to perfect to, to correctly reproduce this increase in shape between uh, the uh, of the contact area between the block and the stratum. That's good. Th thank you for, for letting us know. Great. Uh, I don't know if, we, if there's more questions. Otherwise, I think, thank you so much, uh, Matteo, for your presentation. I think we can start, uh, we can invite the next speaker, Kaylee Joss. Um, her topic is going to be about challenges and innovations in, in NPM modeling of CPTs in interlayer soils. So 
The podium is all yours, Kelly. All right, does everything look okay, Louise? It does, yes. Okay, great. All right, hi everybody, my name is Kaylee Yost. Uh, on behalf of my collaborators, Albiero, Mario Martinelli, Russell Green, and Eileen Martin, uh, I'd like to thank you for coming to my presentation. So today I'm gonna to be talking about challenges and innovations in NPM modeling of CPTs, specifically in interlayered soils. And this is kind of a high level overview of the work I did uh, for my dissertation at Virginia Tech, as well as in collaboration with Del Taros. So first let's talk about the problem that, that I'm trying to solve. So you're probably all familiar with cone penetration tests or CPTs. These are a common method of geotechnical site characterization that involves hydraulically advancing a steel rod with a conical shaped tip into the ground. And that's what this gray area here is supposed to represent. And typically we're gonna record at minimum the tip resistance, which is this face that's imparted on the conical face of the cone, as well as sleeve friction, which is a frictional force along the side of the cone. Now, we consider the CPT to collect high resolution data, which in geotech means we're collecting data at one to five centimeter depth increments, which is pretty good. But we have to understand that the data that's recorded at any particular depth from the CPT is actually characteristic of all of the soil that falls within this zone of influence that forms around the tip of the cone. In other words, the CPT is sensing soil both ahead of and behind the cone tip, and what it's reporting at a given depth is somewhat of an average. So in a homogeneous soil profile, this is of little consequence, but in a profile that has more stratification, data can be, become blurred in these highly interlayered zones. So let me show you graphically what I mean here. Let's consider a CPT, this black area here, that's been advanced through a homogeneous sand profile. We would expect the tip resistance profile to look something like this, where we have a slow increase, and eventually the tip resistance levels off at some characteristic value of the sand at this particular relative density and this particular overburden pressure. Here we're kind of conceptualizing this as a calibration chamber test. So you can imagine we've applied some uh, overburden pressure here. And so throughout the chamber, the overburden pressure is approximately the same. So likewise, if we advance a CPT in a homogeneous clay profile, we would expect a similar tip resistance profile. Of course, now the tip resistance, the characteristic tip resistance is gonna be much lower than what we would have seen for the sand. But if we consider a more complex soil profile, so here we have one that's sand and then um, interspersed with layered sand clay zones. What we can see if we look at this purple trace now is that the tip resistance in these interlayered zones isn't characteristic of the true tip resistance of the clay or of the sand, and the boundary between these layers is blurred. It's really hard to identify where one layer starts and one layer ends just from the tip resistance data. And in the earthquake engineering world, we're calling this phenomenon multiple thin layer effects. So why is that important? Well, Inaccurate characterization of layer thicknesses and stiffnesses, in other words, the tip resistance by the CPT can have really detrimental consequences on engineering predictions that are made using that data. So for example, one example that I'm particularly interested in is the overprediction of soil liquefaction in Christchurch, New Zealand after the 2010-2011 Canterbury earthquakes. And we saw this overprediction in the Western part of the city where we had these complex, highly interlayered soil profiles. And we've attributed this in part due to the underprediction of tip resistance and therefore the underprediction of liquefaction resistance of these thin, dense soil layers that were found in these highly interlayered profiles in that part of the city. And as you can see from this photo on the right, soil liquefaction can be an extremely costly phenomenon and be very damaging to the built environment. So we obviously want to be able to accurately predict it, both for homogeneous and highly interlayered or highly stratified sites. So the goals of my work are to first use numerical tools to help understand mechanisms of multiple thin layer effects in CPT data. And second, to be able to use numerical tools to generate CPT data that can be used to develop and validate multiple thin layer correction procedures. So let's talk a little bit more about the tool. So obviously we use Anura 3D for our models and we found that this was an excellent platform for modeling CPTs. So the geometry I show on this, this page is essentially the geometry I used in most of my simulations. Here we have the cone on the very left-hand side. Uh, we have soil in the, in the zone below, and we have this surcharge layer, which is meant to apply this overburden pressure to the soil profile. Now, in an R3D, we were able to use the 2D axis symmetric formulation, which meant this left side boundary here was our rotational axis of symmetry. 
And this really helps with the computational efficiency of the simulations. We also use the contact algorithm by Bardenhagen et al. That's, that's built into a neuro. And this describes the contact between the cone and the soil around it. Because the cone itself is much stiffer than the soil surrounding it, we were able to use the rigid body algorithm that Zambrano, Cruzati, and Yarrow implemented into an R3D. And finally, the last feature I'll highlight is we used a moving mesh. So that meant this lower portion of the mesh um, beneath the tip of the cone compressed as the cone advanced downward. But above the tip of the cone, we had a zone of moving mesh that moved downward at the same velocity as the cone. And that allowed the contact surface to maintain its definition throughout the entire simulation. All right, so there were several iterations of these tests, but we used the basic model that I described on the following slide to replicate a series of laboratory calibration chamber tests that were performed at Deltares. And this is the chamber that they used at Deltares over here on the right-hand side of the slide. So on the left, you can see uh, we've got the, the cone penetrating through this layered profile. The pink layers represent clay, the blue layers represent sand. And then on the right side of this is the deviatoric strain that develops around the cone as it's advanced. So we use lab data to calibrate and validate our models using constitutive relationships that I've noted on this slide. I'm not gonna get into the details of this because there were a few different iterations and it would take a while to explain each one. But in general, we assumed that the sand layers behaved completely drained and the clay layers behaved completely undrained. And we assigned the appropriate constitutive models based on that. All right, so before I show some of the outcomes of these numerical tests, I wanted to highlight some of the challenges we face and how we address them. So early on in the modeling process, I had some problems with soil material points entering the boundary of the cone tip, which caused numerical instabilities and explosions in the soil. So that's kind of what I'm representing here. So this is a zoomed in view of the, of the cone. Um, the material points that are highlighted in red are cone material points and on the outside is soil. And so you can see what happened here is we have these sand material points that actually penetrated through the surface of the cone. And so this was being caused by this geometric discontinuity at the tip of the cone. So if you look at this figure over here, you can see that it's really easy to define the normal direction perpendicular to the face of this cone all the way up until you get to the point where the cone tip actually inter or intersects with this axis of symmetry. And at that point, we don't really know what direction the normal is, is going to be in. Um, it could fall kind of anywhere within the zone. And so to solve this issue, we implemented the ability to define a specific normal direction at the node that was associated with the cone tip. And this feature is now implemented in GID. So if you apply the contact algorithm, you'll be prompted to either include a node normal correction or not. And if you do want to include it, um, you can specify what direction you want the normal to be in. And you can also specify multiple normal directions. So if you want, uh, if you have a geometry that has multiple discontinuity points, you'll be able to do that for multiple, multiple different points. All right, another one of the challenges we faced was how to define contact in these elements that had multiple material types. In them. So typically sand cone contact is modeled as a fraction of the sand's effective friction angle, and the clay cone contact is modeled as a fraction of the clay's undrained shear strength. But what should we do for elements that contain both clay and sand material points? As you can see in this figure here, as the cone advanced, it not only was the mesh moving so that we would have um, these layer boundaries would now fall within a particular element, but we also have the cone dragging soil down with it. So um, clay material points are now in the zone where the sand layer was before. So we have these elements like I've highlighted at red here where we had both sand and clay material points. And so what we, what we observed was that the contact algorithm was essentially just selecting contact properties associated with one of the types of material points in the element, whichever one it read in first, and it didn't combine the properties in any way. Um, what we ended up doing was performing a sensitivity analysis where we forced the choice of the contact properties to be either the sand cone or the clay cone contact properties. And what we found was in these highly interlayered zones, which is what we were really interested in, there wasn't very much impact on tip resistance. So we assumed that the sand cone contact properties were dominant in those mixed elements. But ideally, in the future, we'd like to incorporate some sort of averaging of the contact properties in these mixed elements. But we really need to think more about how to combine drained and undrained contact properties in the same, in the same element. It's a little more complex, I think, than, than just averaging them. All right, so finally, let's show some results. So 
in the early stages of our modeling, we found that our numerical models were able to replicate laboratory results very close, closely. So if we see this image over here on the left, I'm plotting tip resistance versus depth. The MPM results from our calibrated model are shown in red, and the laboratory results that they measured at Deltaras are shown in black. And you can see we got a really good match between those results. This was a layered sand clay profile. The sand layers are shown in white, and the clay layers are shown in gray. And we also found that we were able to replicate some of the important mechanisms of multiple thin layer effects. So I already mentioned this, but this is a picture, a cross-sectional picture from one of the tests they did at Deltares. And you can see how the cone, it's this center piece right here, uh, has dragged down the soil from the different layers as it moved downward. And we were able to replicate that with the MPM results as well. So once we kind of had our baseline model, we were able to move on and perform some sensitivity analyses to really quantify the uncertainty that was associated with the laboratory experiments and look at how that translated into our numerical models. So a lot of times as, as um, numerical modelers, we might be tempted to think that the laboratory data is kind of the end all be all and we're trying to match our numerical results to it. But the reality is that uh, laboratory tests have a lot of uncertainties built into them and we can kind of look at, look at how those uncertainties um, manifest in the numerical model and, and kind of get a better understanding of how to match our data. So, over here on the left, you can see uh, tip resistance versus depth again. The experimental results from Deltara's lab tests are plotted in black. And then this was a different numer. Uh, this is the same profile, but we used different uh, constitutive model in this model. So it's a little bit different, but you can see our baseline realization is shown in red. So that means we our input parameters were all the best estimate values that we had from our lab data. But then we performed a series of uh, additional tests, the sensitivity realizations, which are shown in light gray, changing one input parameter to its maximum or minimum value that we estimated to be realistic to kind of see how the tip resistance in the entire profile changed. And on the right, I'm showing this tornado plot that shows how much the average tip resistance that's on the x-axis here changes uh, with changing input parameters, which are on the y-axis. And this is a lot of information. I don't expect you to digest all of these variables. But the takeaway is that the tip resistance in the embedded sand layers was found to be much more sensitive to uncertainties in certain parameters compared to others. So for example, um, based on the test we did in the lab, where we were able to say, well, the relative density in those embedded sand layers might vary anywhere from 19 to 39%. And you can see if we input that into our numerical model, we get a really big difference in average tip resistance in, in that embedded sand layer. So it was a useful, tool for us to understand where these uncertainties are coming from and what to do about them. All right, so lastly, we used what we learned from these earlier models to develop a set of more complex soil profiles for CPT simulation. So these are just two of the 15 profiles we developed. We randomly generated this layer geometry. The layers have varying thicknesses. And ultimately, the tip resistance that we generate from these models, which is shown um, in these plots over to the right, is gonna be used to create this large CPT database that can be used to support the development and validation of multiple thin layer correction procedures. And this is useful because these laboratory calibration chamber tests are slow, they're expensive, very time consuming. So if we can support these or supplement them with numerical results, uh, this is a very useful tool. All right, so just to wrap up here in conclusion, I hope I've showed that under a 3D is a powerful tool to study penetration problems in layered media that penetration in layered media presents unique challenges that can be addressed with MPM, and that numerical modeling can provide a cost-effective option for creating these large CPT databases and also to examine uncertainty in laboratory testing. So that's all I've got. I'd be happy to answer any questions. And all of the studies that I mentioned, again, this was a combination of multiple, multiple studies. So you, you're welcome to check out our publications on ResearchGate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. Wonderful presentation. We do have questions here. Uh, the first question is, how did you estimate the initial velocity applied into the CPT cone in the initial stage? And the, there's a follow-up question that says, and how did you simulate the constant rate of penetration? So, so you're able to apply a constant velocity. Um, that's what we did. So the rigid cone was advancing at a constant velocity. And the initial velocity was, was, I guess, zero. I mean, we started the velocity. We used the, the K-naught stress initialization. So we initialized the stresses and then immediately started cone penetration. And I guess the velocity was assigned two centimeters per second or consistent with- That's the correct. Okay. 
Um, yeah. I, yeah. And then there's another question. How was the tip and slip resistant evaluated in the ANURA 3D tool? Using reaction forces alone? Good question. So we didn't look at sleeve resistance. Um, you would have to you would have to assign a surface that you could compute reaction forces um, for the for the sensor that measures the sleeve friction, and that that's a whole nother <laughs> a whole nother task. But we 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 only computed tip resistance. And yes, uh, you compute the reaction force on the tip of the cone, and then translate that into stress. Good. Um... Okay, thank you so much, uh, Kaylee, uh, for your presentation. And I, now I'd like to invite uh, Luis Aviles. And the topic of his presentation is simulation of the construction process of embankments using MPM. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you, but um, I don't know, like the volume is a little bit lower. If you could make it a little bit higher. No, now it's better. Now it's better. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this presentation. My name is Luis Angel Aviles, and today I'm going to talk about layer reconstruction process using the material point method. I, for some, the motivation for this work was taught to four. One was to have a numerical tool that allows us to simulate the construction and large displacement. And MPN, and with that, can, we could control the settlements or displacement during the construction. And the second motivation was that during these construction stages, can evaluate if the material failures and if the failure occurred, can simulate their failure uh, with the Uh, we cannot hear you now, uh, Luis. Yes. Yeah, that now it's better. As is shown in the picture, that was exactly the problem that happened in the Calia in 2018, where the failure occurred during the construction process. The Calia tailing dance is an uh, upstream air dam that was constructed in 10 stages of construction. And the failure occurred in the last of the stages during the construction of the battery, battery stages. And it's supposed that the, the failure occurred in the foundation of the, in the tailings dam. And the idea when we find, we find this kind of problem is to simulate the process because we all know that the initial stresses in this kind of problem is different as if we initialize the stresses using vertical to horizontal relation to a procedure, or if we initialize the stresses using the complete model and applying gravitational effects. So in this kind of stages, the, the stresses and um, state variables are no longer homogeneous to all the model, and that was the purpose of the implementation. This feature, this new feature of the construction was implemented in Anura 3D. As we know, Anura uh, 3D used a Lagrangian Eulerian approach, and has implement has the MPN works. And uh, during the Lagrangian phase, we solved the momentum. Uh, again, uh, we can hear you. Sorry? Yeah, we couldn't hear the last part that you were. The, as we all know, yeah. uh, MPN is a Lagrangian Averian approach where during the um, phase, we solve the momentum equation to compute the nodal acceleration. Then in the Eulerian or convective uh, phase, we transfer that information to the material point where we compute the strain, stresses, a state variable, or the state variable, and we updated the material point position. So the new feature of the construction process is implemented prior to all these computational cycles. 
the new feature works as follows. The first one will define the volume that will be constructed during the quarantine step. Then we initialize the material points that belong. And we solve the momentum equation. We transfer the solution from the nodal value to the material point. We compute the strain, the stresses, update the state variables, and update the position of the material point. And after that, we check for empty element. And this is a key element of the implementation because we, when we use soft materials, some settlement can occur or some large displacement can occur, and material point leave some empty element during the construction process. So we need to refill those empty elements in order to fulfill the initial level of the construction that was implemented during the design stages. After all these elements are fulfilled, we continue with the next step of construction. To check this implementation, we use a layer soil column composed by a different number of layers. The initial part of the simulation of this implementation use the preprocessing kit to assign the number of layers of the construction and assign the material to each one of the layers to be constructed. The assignment, the boundary condition, and the number of material points. All of these features are initial assignment in, in the preprocessing of kit. Then we do the construction during using a single step construction. It means that each layer is constructed in a single step. However, the time of every single step can vary in order to take different Again, uh, could you put your microphone again close? It's a... Uh... I cannot hear you. No. Now, now I can hear you. This is great. Okay, some result of the construction process uh, are shown here. Here we can see the construction evolution of the uh, of the soil column using five layer. And uh, we plot also the analytical solution using a parabolic equation with elastic material and constant parameters given in the table. Uh, we can see that as we increase the number of the construction layer, the numerical result get close to the analytical one. However, because of the, because the analytical one, the flow is density, the analytical under predict the vertical displacement along the column, along the side column. So to to get more realistic the, the prediction, we, we take the average of the density at the end of the soil column construction, and we see that the analytical solution much better to the numerical result employing 20 layers. The, that's good. Also, we compare this implementation using finite element method with the same problem using five layers of construction, 10 layers of construction, and 20 layers of construction. And we see the results in terms of the vertical space. So we can be sure that the construction is accurately reproduced in both cases. So in this stage, we also use GIF simulation for the post-processing results. And to emphasize the difference in between or the importance of the refill, the empty elements, here we see we can see that when we ref, we refill the elements, the soil column reach the final level of the construction. Why? If 
we don't fill the empty elements, the final settlement are more for the solid color in terms of the stresses. Also, we get more stresses in the bottom part of the solid color when we use the refill option for the empty elements. We employ this implementation for pigment construction process using elastic material and comparing to condition dry and saturated condition. Here we can Okay, can you, yeah, now, now we have you back again. Um, here we present the results in terms of vertical stresses using MPN use, and using panel in the method. We can see that during the evolution of the construction, both results are the same. Uh, we, we compare the results in terms of vertical displacement. We see also they are or the displacement is the same. Now, in, in according with the soil column, we can see that the maximum displacement are around of the center of the model. The embankment was also simulated using fully coupled condition, implementing in adaptive D with a conductivity one or one minus three meter by second. And each one time step for the construction layer was of five seconds. We can see the pore pressure distribution equivalent vertical is effective stress that we get for that uh, construction. In order to see if the construction fulfill the final level of the the construction or the implementation to fulfill the final level of the construction. We compare the result using a soft material with a John modulus of one megapascal. And we can see that in the lateral part of the point leave the construction zones. But at the end, we can we reach the same level of the construction that we impose during the layers. Uh, finally, we, this implementation, like, this is uh, like a feature, new feature, so it doesn't modify any, you know, the code in the line 3D. So we can combine this new feature with the excavation feature. Here we present some result of the, sorry, We can see the evolution of the construction and the excavation at the end of the construction. These are just to illustrate the construction process that works with the excavation process also. Um, from here, we can see that the state variables and the stresses are no longer homogeneous to the model. So, as the conclusion, we can say the construction process can be adequately simulated using the material point methods. This procedure has been implemented in the MPM code and the 3 d And the construction and the implementation offers the possibility of filling the grid element that becomes empty during the construction. And this option reproduces the the real problem that we present during the construction wars due to the settlements. And the result provide a more accurate prediction of the settlement and stresses and is more yeah. adequate for initialized constitutive model when we want to try this kind of external solid model from a realistic initial condition. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luis. Wonderful presentation. And there is a question already in the chat. 
I think it's the question everybody's asking now. Is this method available in Anura 3D? I can, we cannot hear you. Yes, it will be soon because I have to, to unload the changes. Good, good, excellent. And I, I do have a, a follow up question. And it's Sorry, Luis. yes. Can I just add something that the construction process, yes, it implemented in the locally uh, in the version of Luis, and we plan to add it in the next release on next day and also to adapt the, the GID interface. So now it's not in the code, in the, in the release of this year. So just to, just to say, okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I have a question regarding, say, uh, implementation. So you, you are creating new material points or they are created beforehand. I, what, I, what I understood is that you are kind of creating material points as you go. And I think in that means you have to kind of resize all your uh, material points arrays in, in real time. We, initially we define the volume that will be constructed in one layer, right? The, so we simulate the, that layer of construction, but eventually if doing that simulation, some element get empty, we put more elements, more material points in those empty elements. And this material point will have the same initial condition and the same state variable that the original ones of that layer. And that process continue until there is no more empty element during that calculation stage. After the, it's checked and there is no more empty element, we continue with the new uh, construction stage. Okay, thank you. Okay, I don't know if, if anybody has more questions or no. I think it's a good time for uh, a, a break. Don't know if, uh, let me see. Okay, I don't know if there is uh, any announcement perhaps. Uh, back then in Italy. Maybe a general one. Uh, well, yes. part of the uh, part of the um, let's say uh, development uh, uh, that we are showing today, especially in this second part, uh, are not available in the in the code in the in the official release because it's uh, well we need to test them. But you can, uh, as Gaia just said, uh, you can always contact people. Uh, developing the, the, what you are interested in. So you can start working directly and maybe you can help uh, uh, the community in uh, preparing, uh, let's say the, the final commit to the, no, so to to the release to, to validate. Yes, well, to validate it. Uh, so we can provide uh, reliable uh, tools uh, to everybody. So don't be shy. <laughs> send an email and you can start working uh, even by tomorrow. Yeah. And I do have another announcement. Uh, this year in September 14 and 15, uh, the 14th uh, MPN workshop, uh, US MPN workshop is going to be held here at the University of Maine. So if you are interested on uh, submitting uh, your abstracts for uh, oral presentations, uh, please do so. I will uh, share with you the web page address so you can have more information there. So I, th I think I did share the link, but don't know if I did it only to the... You, you, not to everyone, Luis. Uh, you have to click and put everyone. 
uh, when you send, you have to click on two and click everyone instead of host and panelist. Yeah, but the option everyone is not in my... Okay, I, I can share that. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. So everyone is welcome. And please come and know the beautiful state of Maine. So are we coming back in? Oh yes, uh, we're coming back minutes. In, in 35 minutes. That will be, I think, uh, 15 p.m. back in Europe or 9.30 a.m. Eastern time here in the U.S. All right, everyone, welcome back. Um, this will be our last set of presentations, today's workshop. Um, and Pietro will be starting us off. Pietro Maraggio will be talking about dry granular flows impacting rigid obstacles. Uh, Pietro, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen and get us started. Okay, thank you for the introduction. I'm gonna share my yeah, screen. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Now you should see the screen too, I guess. I see the screen, but still can't hear you. I, I can hear him. I, I can oh. hear him too. <laughs> my sound is all the way down for some reason. I'm sorry, go ahead. So, okay. Okay, thank you very much. So in today's presentation, uh, I will uh, discuss uh, the role of positive modeling when simulating uh, the impact uh, of dry granular flows against rigid obstacles. So uh, this work, uh, well, I've been working on that uh, with my colleague Matteo, uh, who uh, presented uh, in the previous section, in the previous session. Uh, and yeah, the idea is to study uh, the, the impact of uh, granular masses uh, against rigid wall. And in particular is to uh, trying to simulate uh, not just the, I mean, yeah, the general behavior, but also trying to understand if we are capable with advanced numerical tools, uh, coupled with uh, advanced positive models uh, to, uh, reproduce even the physical um, mechanical behavior taking places inside the mass. And I'm referring to uh, wave propagation inside the, inside the mass impacting. Uh, and also what I'm interested in is to understand whether I can reproduce the so-called phase transition. So you all know that uh, the uh, a dry material, uh, well, uh, in general, a granular material, may behave like a solid or a fluid when propagating. So for this reason, uh, I, I started uh, a few years ago working on material point method and implementing a viscoelastoplastic constitutive model. So the one mentioned by my colleague before. And well, I mean, uh, I'm now considering a model, but in general, this is a framework. So what we call multi-regime framework. So the idea is to have two different contributions describing the material behavior, one associated to force chains, actually, and one associated to collision. So uh, if you think about, for example, a Binga model, which is which is one, one of the models that we share uh, in our distribution, uh, you may think that the force chains response more or less is represented by what happens when the stress state is below the, um, the limit value. So the threshold, while when this threshold is uh, uh, is overpassed by by the stress state, then something happens. So we are describing the material as an equivalent Newtonian one. So that part may refer to what happens when force chains drops. So the system is starting evol evolving uh, when you have uh, uh, collisions among grains, and that's the way the system interacts. Uh, I say that this is a framework and not a, and not a model because uh, you can describe these two uh, different contribution as you prefer. Uh, well, 
I did it uh, considering an elastic-plastic low uh, with a mixed isotropic kinematic hardening, meaning that I have a cap uh, in the yield surface, uh, and I considered the critical state theory. Uh, this was mainly because I wanted a unique set of parameters describing all the material behavior, considering dense state, uh, loose state, and so on. Okay, the drawback of this is that I need uh, an evolving law for to govern the instantaneous elastic collision, and basically I needed to implement the energy balance so that I have uh, uh, an evolving law describing that part. Uh, so, from uh, I, again a physical perspective, this means that when I when I shear my, my, my soil sample at high strain rate, what, can, what happens is what we call uh, dry liquefaction. So because of this so large energy content, uh, because of the large strain rate, all the system force change drops, and then the system starts uh, uh, being governed by uh, collisions, okay? And this is something that you can see if you look at this, uh, picture on the right, you see it uh, by focusing on the energy content. So the, the system is storing energy, not, not only elastically, but also in terms of uh, kinetic fluctuating energy. So the system is very agitated and a number of collisions uh, are, are the, characterizing the, the state. Okay, so, uh, well, this was done uh, uh, before, of course, implementing the model in MPM, and we compared the results with the uh, discrete element data. Uh, we choose them data, and, and the same works for the uh, impact itself, because by considering discrete element data instead of uh, real experiments, uh, of course, uh, you are not uh, uh, clearly, you are considering ideal states, but you may have access to a lot, a number of information uh, governing uh, the, let's say, the macro, the micro uh, behavior uh, inside the mass. Okay, so for example, you can uh, study the propagation of waves inside the mass. Uh, you can uh, actually check the stress state, the, all the porosity, and so. So for this reason, I decided to go on considering uh, them data as a comparison. So we decided to take a reference configuration uh, already available in literature. We performed a, a few additional simulation. Uh, and, but then, yeah, we, we started considering, uh, let's say a rectangular mass impacting a vertical wall uh, with a different uh, initial velocity and porosity as well. So uh, here are the results. Uh, so, well, First of all, I've calibrated the model, uh, and so I'm using just one set of parameters uh, uh, for any combination of initial velocity and initial porosity. I'm stressing this point because if you use traditional model, what we call single regime model, uh, like for example, I don't know, Mark Coulomb or or uh, well, Bingham as well, so that are uh, pretty common in literature, uh, well, then you may tune your parameter according to initial state while we wanted just a unique set of parameters. As you can see now on the left, we have the evolution of the horizontal impact force on the wall with time, uh, considering a fixed porosity, initial porosity, of course, uh, unique for the, for the mass and, ch and changing the initial velocity. Of course, as you see, the impacting force increasing by increasing the velocity, uh, but also there is a, sh a shift in time uh, considering the peak value. On the other end, if we fix the velocity and change the porosity, we have again a dependency, uh, both uh, in the uh, maximum force uh, and let's say uh, instant of time where you have the so-called buckling, which is associated to uh, uh, almost nullification of the impact force, which is due to the dynamicity of the, of the phenomenon. But when you're considering, as we will see, very, very, uh, porous um, granular materials, then you may not have this kind of uh, nullification, okay? And the reason will be discussed at the end of the presentation. Then I wanted also to consider in the front inclination, 
So together with Matteo, we did uh, some simulation considering different front inclination. And you see that here, there is, uh, uh, let's say, a shift, both a shift in, in the impact force, maximum impact force. And you see that uh, more or less the, uh, let's say, the, 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 um, the system is less uh, uh, impulsive in the, in the response. OK, so there is a delay. Uh, well, we if we think about the results um, discussed by Maria, this more or less looks similar if you're considering, for example, the blue curve. Okay. So you don't have such an high value at the beginning, but you have a more, let's say, smooth uh, uh, impact uh, uh, with time, okay, up to uh, residual value. Good. Okay, so in this in this picture, you see the evolution of velocity. Uh, during the impact. And what is nice is that you see that there is, uh, after the impact, there is the affirmation of uh, what we call the dead zone, which is uh, close to the to the wall, at the bottom of the wall, and which act as a ramp. So you see that this, the, let's say you have a, an upper region of material, which is sliding on a, on a lower region, which is more or less still since the very beginning. And then there is this ramp. So you have the, the jet of material, which is, which is let's say, uh, going upwards. OK, so it, it is interesting that most of the contribution is provided by the dead zone itself, while the upper zone, which is very uh, loose and collisional, uh, is not contributing a, a lot on the, on the actual force, on the integral of the force uh, with time. As I said, I'm interested in checking the energy contribution because this so these are the ratio between uh, the elastic energy stored and the kinetic energy stored, kinetic fluctuating energy stored. So there is more or less it's a ratio of energy stored uh, by force chains and uh, let's say collisional regime. And what you see is that there is a after the impact there is a progress solidification of the of the mass. Uh, but then suddenly you see like a, a rarefaction wave associated to liquefaction starting from the top of the mass to the bottom. And this kind of liquefaction is associated to the drop in force. So as, as we discussed before, we have the, the, the maximum force at the beginning with a sudden drop. Okay. Then we, if we go on, when we have the dead zone formation, we have uh, we see that progressively this region is going to become solid and, and solid with time. If we wait uh, enough time, of course, uh, the uh, region uh, um, associated to the dead zone increases until uh, uh, the system, which becomes still at, still at, at the end of the, um, of the simulation. Let's now discuss the, pro the, the waves propagate, propagating inside the mass after the impact. We have mainly two different waves. One is the compression wave starting from the front to the tail, and one is the rarefaction wave. So the one starting associated to the buckling of the, of the, um, of the mass itself, uh, and this is propagating from top to bottom. What we see now, we have a, a comparison between uh, the uh, results in terms of uh, wave velocity, uh, both obtained by considering single regime model, that is uh, a more Coulomb with uh, uh, nonlinear elasticity, exactly the same, same one that we have in, in our multi regime model, and uh, uh, DEM data. Okay, as you can see, them and MPM with the uh, multi regime model matches perfectly, while we have uh, uh, we, we, we drop, so we, we don't have the, um, the dependency of both uh, compression, compression and rarefaction wave uh, for uh, um, small values of full number. Okay, so in, in this region, uh, we have a, a large discrepancy, while for higher value of full number, so higher velocities then more or less the two approaches are similar. Uh, well, if we consider uh, the evolution of the compression wave with the porosity, so as I mentioned before, we have uh, a sudden, uh, let's say, um, a sudden reduction in, uh, in the compression wave, which actually become uh, a compaction wave. So imagine having a very loose system, which is impacting a stiff wall, okay? 
So instead of generating a compression wave going to the tail, then you have this very loose system which is compacting close to the mass. So, and this is, uh, uh, well, is something that we then uh, see con by considering even the evolution of the force with time. So there is no nullification because of that compaction wave, which is preventing the rarefaction wave uh, um, traveling to the bottom of the mass itself. So I introduced results consider the single regime model, so more Coulomb. Uh, again, qualitatively, the results are not are not bad if you consider a more Coulomb. Uh, my well, my colleague and friend Francesca did some work in the past, but uh, well, the the thing is that the main drawback of considering such an approach, which is in general good, is that you have to tune parameters when you change porosity, for example, and you don't want in case you wanna you wanna have a prediction tool, you wanna calibrate once and then use it. Uh, we use every every time the same set of parameters. So with that, I'm going to the conclusion. Uh, so the idea is that uh, we can simulate the impact of the dry granular masses considering different initial condition, porosities, front inclination, and so. We can simulate this nice, uh, as, as far as I mean, I'm, uh, let's say, more uh, in, well, more. Yeah, I'm into also considering modeling. It's very nice to uh, being able to reproduce this solid fluid transition and vice versa. But next step, which is extremely interesting, we already started doing this, is implementing the saturated version of the constitutive model uh, inside the code so that we can start simulating this uh, uh, in, in case of saturated granular mass. And this is done uh, by considering a double phase, double point approach. Okay. So with that, I thank you so much for your time and attention. And I'm here uh, if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Thanks, Pietro. I don't see any questions in the Q&A box I do yet. have a question. Go ahead, Luis. Uh, actually, I have many. <laughs> uh, so... You mentioned that the, the model is critical state based, right? Yeah. So you're thinking that as you approach like less large deformation, you get to critical void ratio. But then also as you get uh, in this regime where you have collision and forces, the void ratio should increase because of that regime. So is your critical state line in space E versus B changing with time in your constitutive model? That's a very nice question. Yes, it's changing. Actually, the critical state uh, that we know as a so soil-based uh, mechanism uh, is extended. So it's it's just, uh, let's say the critical state we know, uh, so the one from Cambridge, is basically one of the steady state that uh, granular soil can uh, go. Okay, so that's the particular case when the granular temperature, that is the state of the material, is very small. Basically, you have to consider even uh, the uh, state of agitation of the material, which is uh, uh, governing. So you have an, an additional dimension. So, uh, yeah, and that's why you need uh, to consider, let's say, also a change in the in the um, in volumes and also in the uh, in the stress ratio with uh, agit with the agitation of the material. So yeah, that's uh, the critical state for me. It's just one of the steady state that the material can reach. And in particular is the one for small strain rate. And it, do you see any effect of say mass of the particle? If you say refine your mesh, your particle mass is gonna be lower, right? But if if your mesh say is a little bit more coarser, your particle mass is higher. So do you see an effect of that in your simulations with your constitutive model? Um, not in particular. I mean, uh, it's, well, you have to, to have a small, small mesh. Otherwise, uh, yes, there is a small uh, uh, mesh dependency, but then not in particular. So we, we change uh, uh, some sometimes until we find a, a, a good solution in terms of mesh refinement, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you for your question.
Thanks, Pietro. I think we'll go ahead and move on. If the audience has any more questions, please feel free to drop them in the, in the Q&A and I'm sure Pietro will be able to respond. Sure. All right, so next up we have Guido Remerswald and he's gonna to talk to us about evaluation of Gauss integration schemes in NPM for strain dependent soils. Yes, you should be able to see my screen now, in theory. Looks good. good. Um, so indeed, you mentioned the title of the presentation a bit better than I actually wrote it on the screen, Evaluation of Gauss Integration Schemes. It's actually two schemes. Uh, we will be seeing uh, what the different schemes are. Um, to start off, um, we will be looking at the mixed integration scheme, which is the end of the referee. Um, where we are basically using a sort of Gauss integration scheme instead of a standard variable integration scheme. Uh, having some it, feedback on the voice. Is anybody else also having that issue? Yes. Yes, we have the same issue. Maybe you, you can stop your video. Just keep sharing the screen, but stop the video. Stop the video. We, just to before it worked a little bit. So I don't know. Is it better now? Not sure. Maybe if you turn your own video off, it will help. Yes. If I turn my own video off. Your, your camera. camera. Ah, okay. Let's see. Um, can I turn it off here? Is that better? For now, yep. Okay. Um, so, uh, what I'm going to present today is the framework of NPM mixed and another scheme which will which I'll come to uh, in a bit. Um, I will then give you a problem description of comparing the actual uh, two schemes. Uh, I will give you results based on CPT, a column collapse, uh, a conclusion, and then an outlet. Um, if we actually look at the different schemes, uh, the NPM scheme, mixed scheme. Uh, here we are actually averaging our material properties to Gauss points. So what we do is each and every element we split up into several uh, subdomains based on four Gauss points in our case. Uh, and we're then calculating the average properties of these Gauss points. Uh, and we're using these Gauss points for our uh, force calculations and basically our finite element calculations within the MPM scheme. Um, this reduces a lot your oscillations and fluctuations which you tend to have in NPM uh, and therefore give you much more stable outcomes. Um, what we do is we map our properties from, from NPMs to uh, Gauss points. We're then calculating the movement of our finite element scheme. Um, then use our Gauss points for our stress integration, uh, which basically uh, implements our constitutive behavior. And we're then finally mapping the displacement of our mesh to the material points and changing the material point properties based on the properties of the Gauss points we calculate. Um, what we were investigating in this work is basically what is the effect of all the averaging and replacing of our material properties with these Gauss points properties. Uh, what kind of effect does that actually have on uh, our final on our MPM results? Um, to give us some details of what you actually do in some uh, edge cases in the MPM mix scheme, uh, in case we have almost empty subdomains, so for example, only one material point uh, is present in the subdomain, we are just using that individual material point as the stress state of our Gauss point. Um, in case we have completely empty subdomains, we are then uh, filling that subdomain um, with the material properties of the closest material point. Uh, and then we have the two cases for when we have boundary elements, or so basically elements on the uh, boundary of our material. Um, in that case, we have two options. We can either use standard NPM, or we can use the, the option where we are basically using NPM mixed, but filling the empty subdomains based on the material point properties of the closest material points. Um, and if we have elements with two or more materials, which we have seen a lot uh, today in the different presentations, then again, we can use either standard MPM or we can do the averaging procedure in each uh, material point material separately. So we're only averaging 
um, the material properties from each material and not actually combining the different materials together. Um, what are we actually changing in this new scheme which we tried to develop? Um, is we are still averaging, averaging properties to the Gauss points and we're still using those Gauss points for internal force calculations. But now we're no longer uh, mapping everything back to the material points. So we're using the actual material points for our stress integration. Um, this ensures that we can keep uh, our own uh, integration and that we keep the history of the material points um, and that um, we do not actually remove the entire history of our material points from the entire calculation. So what is the outcome of these two different themes? Uh, first of all, a CPT calculation with a more central positive model. Um, here we can see that both monotonic and the cyclic loading, MPM mixed, and this GP scheme give good and comparable results. And we expect that this is the case because there's no actual material softening in this model, and it's mainly based on a hardening type of model. And this apparently gives um, comparable results between the different schemes. Um, the other problem which we tested was uh, actually two different models, um, but both uh, column collapse. Uh, in the first model, we do not have any material softening. And in the second model, we used a strain softening uh, Tresca model, um, where after roughly 6% of accumulated plastic strains, we actually reach 95% uh, of our uh, strength reduction. What we saw in the uh, scheme without soft uh, in the problem without softening is that we get a good match between our deviatoric strains uh, and our plastic accumulated deviatoric strains, which we're using in our constitutive model. And we see that this match uh, is matching well in both methods. So both MPM mixed and MPM GP are giving us good agreement between the, the total deviatoric strain and the actual input of our constitutive model. Um, what we see in the GP scheme, we have slightly um, sharper um, softening or, or softener bands where the strain actually accumulates. Um, then finally, in the softening problem, uh, we can see that in the MPM mix scheme, we have quite some spreading of our softening behavior, whereas in the MPM GP scheme during translation, uh, the softening is still contained within the shear bands where it actually should be contained, um, which is more pronounced in the actual second failure, where we can see in the uh, mix scheme that the softening really spreads throughout the entire domain. Um, but in the GP scheme, uh, the softening is really located within the uh, shear bands and the domain outside of these shear bands uh, stays much more stable. Um, to look at it in a bit more detail, we looked at a couple of material points within this domain. Um, and then you can see that in uh, MPM mixed, where we see on the top graph uh, the deviatoric strains and on the bottom graph the accumulated plastic strains, you can see that in the mixed schemes, the plastic strains are actually uh, oscillating up and down. And there's not really a consistency between the, the top figure. Whereas on the right hand side, we see in the GP scheme that these are much more consistent. Um, and you also see that clearly with the second failure, where we see that the uh, amount of accumulated plastic strains we have in the shear band is much higher, and it's also consistently increasing instead of uh, oscillating up and down. Um, when we have a quick look at the strength of the material, again, in the mixed scheme, you can see the strength sort of oscillating up and down during failure. Whereas in the GP scheme, you see a constant decrease of our strength, which is a, uh, in agreement with our constitutive model. Um, and we see that the same uh, with the secondary failure. So what are our conclusions? Uh, MPM mix and MPM GP are identical, uh, give identical results for materials without softening. Um, and if we actually look at the cases with softening, we can see that MPM mix spreads the softening during translation. Um, and this causes even material strength recovery. And the GP scheme, uh, it matches the softening to the strain response and it gives much sharper softening bands. And that was uh, my presentation of today.
Thanks so much. Great presentation. Uh, we do have time for a few questions. All right, I see one came into the chat. So Jerome wants to know which mappings between Gauss points and material points are chosen and with which justification? Um, there's actually no mapping. So it's a straight up averaging procedure. So within these subdomains, we're really just averaging the different properties. Um, and we are not mapping different things. And we chose that because it gave us stable results. We tested a couple of things and this was just the more, most stable outcome. I, have I a had a question. Okay. <laughs> what is the computational time difference between the two? Um, the GP scheme is really fast because uh, the mixed scheme is really fast because you're only calculating things on Gauss points and, you, and you're evaluating your constitutive behavior only once for each or four times for each element, uh, independent of how many material points you have. Um, the GP scheme is a lot more intensive in that case because you're actually evaluating things on each and every material point. Can I, can I ask my question? Uh, my question is regarding the integration scheme of the constitutive model itself. What type of integration scheme are you using? And then uh, do you see, based on your study, uh, suggestions of what uh, integration scheme is better? Is better so. um, we haven't in investigated different integration schemes there. It's an explicit final L uh, MPM formulation. And for the constitutive model, I think it's the Sloan implementation. Uh, which is an explicit for Euler, I think, from what I remember. Uh, we haven't investigated anything, and I haven't seen really any proof that we should use anything different. One more question from the Q&A. Um, does this method mitigate volumetric blocking if we use a reduced quadrature scheme for the Gauss point? Um, a bit. So oh, yes, it, it helps it a bit, but we're still using a sort of F-bar scheme to, to improve that further. Uh, one more. Is the GP valid for double point application? Um, and with the double point, you mean the, the water and um, solids, I guess. Um, it should be valid, I think. We haven't tested it. We, we are only using the one point formulation. All right, I think we will go ahead and move on. Thanks, Guido. No problem. All right, so next up is Alexander Kimonichki, and he's going to talk to us about accuracy and stability of MLS-based MPM. Okay. Kelly, can you tell me if you can hear me and the presentation is correctly shown? I can hear you, but I don't see the presentation in presentation mode. Okay, give me a sec. now perfect looks good okay perfect so thanks a lot um for the short introduction um i will talk about the accuracy stability of a uh, movingly square based npm today and like slightly starting with a little overview what kind of verification for our dynamic formulation we can do and what we have so basically when we're in one phase and we have a the momentum equation under the assumption of linear elasticity and let's say 1d we ending up with something like this here which is like a, an equation in the displacements which is actually a wave equation so when we want to validate the dynamic formulation for example for one phase we have actually to look for some wave equation because the solutions of those equations are mainly wave propagation so in 1d we would have for example from the well-known Wave equation, if we look at 1D boundary conditions, some waves that are running from left to right or right to left. Um, if we look at the couple formulation, again, it's like two momentum equations that we're dealing with, also incorporated the mass conservation. Um, it's again a wave, wave equation like formulation that we're actually looking at, but it's a coupled wave propagation. And there is an analytical solution by Perovitz. Um, and also, like already in the in the first investigations of BO in the young, some things can be found. So what we're looking then at is a coupled wave propagation. 
which looks something like this. We see the blue line is the pore pressure when we apply here at the right uh, side of an effective stress boundary condition. Uh, the red line is the effective stress. So in the beginning, if the parameters are chosen properly, um, both pore pressure and effective stresses are split into both phases. The dashed line is the total stress. So there we see actually, again, the one phase solution when we sum up the, equation, uh, the effective stresses and the pore pressure. So we have one wave, and then we have a second wave where the effective stress is increasing again. That's the so-called drain wave, and the pore pressure dissipates. And actually, what is coming then later is the dynamic consolidation, where the pore pressures after a while, when we would look at the infinite column, would dissipate to zero, and the effective stresses would go to one as the boundary conditions. So these are, like for example, small deformation verifications example that we can use to see the accuracy of our numerical method. So for quasi-static, when we neglect all kind of inertia, when we neglect also the soil movement and the body forces using the mass conservation for both phases, we ending up with something like this, which is basically under the uh, in the absence of body forces something like a heat equation and this is the well-known solution that we can also again validate for our numerical methods where we have the Chatsagi consolidation and we have the solution where we see the pore pressures dissipating which is basically quite similar to if we look just at the heat equation the dissipation or uh, cooling down of an initial temperature condition so we can when we're using the actually dynamic formulation as we do, we solving actually the wave equations, which we've seen before, but we can approximate those quasi-static equations by damping. In our case, we call it an annular local damping. And by this, we still have some remaining wave propagation artifacts that are still like a little bit um, traveling over through the column. But in general, we can use also this example for the verification of the numerical scheme. For large deformation verification, it looks a little bit more difficult, let's say, um, but there's like the method of manufactured solutions that gives us a tool how we can verify the accuracy of our uh, codes on large deformation processes. So here, the idea between, uh, behind the manufactured solution is to assume a displacement field, which is basically such an axis aligned deformation with sinusoidals and looks something like this in time. So basically we pushing and pulling from one corner to another along the axis and the material points are traveling. Under the assumption of a new Hookian material model, we can calculate the external forces that are needed to obtain this kind of solution. And therefore we can then in our numerical scheme just apply the external forces with the proper boundary conditions and see how well it behaves again the primary uh, assumed displacement field. So let's have a look what happens. What happens when we're using the standard MPM? So we have the blue points are the material points. The red vector fields are the velocities that are generated by the numerical solution. And the yellow ones are the analytical ones. So when you look at the, at the arrow, and here I summed up the arrow over all material points, and then took the L2 norm of all those deviations that we have seen here in the picture, we see an error development that looks something like this over the time step. So the error increases going down, increases going down. Every time it goes down, it's actually then when our material points coincide with the Gauss point location, because then we have the most accurate integration as we also seen in the previous presentation. So when once we are deviating from this position, the error increases. So this, this is how the standard MPM, um, I, I forgot to mention one thing. So like the displacement field has an amplitude that we can choose to mimic different conditions. So that was like for, uh, uh, for an amplitude of 0 0.025. Let's increase this um, amplitude a little bit and see what will happen. So we see once the amplitude reaches a certain volume, our domain here is a part, so to say, in different pieces. And um, this is basically due to the linear shape functions that we are using, which 
having just a complex support over the neighbor, so like oh, only the neighboring elements to one node have a non-zero value, the rest has zero. So once there is a gap occurring of one empty element, the communication between the grid and the material points is lost, and therefore we have some kind of such behavior. So in general, what we're dealing with, like the idea of accuracy or for our method, especially for MPM, is that we, as we also have seen in the development of the error, is when we are when we have structured data that is like nicely distributed, for example, as we have in the initial condition, when we have the material points placed in the Gauss point position and integrating, actually everything is fine. So when we have data that is like scattered uh, around the whole domain, arbitrary, we have an issue to reconstruct our solutions because there may be two less points, there are maybe somehow linear dependently, they are maybe not properly giving enough information to reconstruct the solution that we have at the material points, at the nodes, and vice versa. Therefore, the moving the squares method is something that is quite common in the um, mesh free methods, where actually they're dealing all the time with such kind of cases. They have a scattered data and they're trying to approximate the global solution based on the points that we have given by this data. So like in SPH, in Galec, in free method, and so on. The approximation function then looks like this. So this is like the global approximation that we then then we need to uh, that we are using to reconstruct the function on our domain, which is based on the data points. So in our case, the UI could be either the data that we have at the material points and we're using to reconstruct the function based on the material point data, but actually it can also be used when we have the data at the nodes and we're trying to reconstruct the global approximation um, at the material points or somewhere else. So basically we can plug in any kind of position and we're getting by this the reconstructed function based on this data set that we have. So in general, there's an explicit solution for this minimization problem as it is a least square approximation. So basically weighted least square approximation. We have some kind of weighting functions that we're using for the data. Then we have some kind of polynomial basis that we're using and some matrix, the so-called uh, moment matrix M that we have to invert. In 2D, this would look something like this. We would have the different in, in the weighting function as a product in X and Y direction, and you would form such kind of matrix that we need then to invert. We can use different shape functions, actually, a different weighting function for this. So we could use the B splines, or we can use any arbitrary like the Gaussian, or like I like to use the Wendland function and guarantee the conservation of momentum and mass, mass by using the partition of unity. So basically normalizing this weighting function. Then this looks something like this. This is like the Wendland function, different nodes at 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And the sum, as we can see, is the dotted line is always one everywhere. So regarding this matrix that we have seen, we need to take care a little bit because as we see for two dimensions, this matrix, as it is the dyadic product of the coordinate vector is a rank one matrix because the dyadic products are always a rank one matrix because they span only by this one vector. Um, that means we have some kind of restrictions when we're using this higher order reconstruction. This is that we need a minimum number of material points to reconstruct some point. As we see in this case, it would be necessary to have at least three points to be able to reconstruct the third, like a full rank matrix of rank three, which we could then invert. And this is also requires a linear independent coordinate vectors, meaning that those vectors, even though we have maybe three points, but if the three points are all in one line, as we can see here, like for the point one, two, and four, we will lose one dimension and we won't be able to invert this. This is kind of a like strict requirement. On the other side, when we're using standard MPM, this matrix is a constant. And actually standard MPM is quite robust if you're looking at this from this perspective of reconstruction, because we don't need to invert a matrix. And this constant is never zero that we're using there because it's just one. In this case, if we want more accuracy, we will have this more requirements. But to overcome these issues, i have actually using the regularization. So the regularized moving the squares approximation that is regularizing the 
data by parameter lambda and guarantees that we can always invert our moment matrix. This is unfortunately affecting slightly the results, but we will see in a second how. So let's go back to these two cases that I've shown and let's reconstruct just for one step a function, which is basically the peak function in MATLAB. So what we see, if we reconstruct it on structured data, the error that we have, that's the relative L2 error, is quite low for the standard MPM where we're using linear B-splines, but also for quadratic cubic and the Wendland function, we have actually small errors. When we're moving to unstructured data, the error increases significantly. And we see that actually the B-spline, the linear case of uh, linear shape functions is definitely the worst one. And with regularization, so every time the matrix M cannot be inverted, I'm using regularization, we can improve the error also like to a certain amount, we can do it further and further. The influence of the, uh, of, the, uh, per, um, of the regularization parameter is plotted here. So basically when the parameter that I'm using for Lambda is really small, it doesn't affect the results that much. But if it's becoming too large, it affects the results significantly. So there's like always a, needs to be a careful choice of the parameter Lambda to properly regularize the data. Here we see once more this for the different functions with different chosen uh, lengths of the compact support. And we see that, for example, uh, the functions with cubic B splines and with the Wendland function actually having kind of a local minimum here. If you go smaller, the results are again getting bad because the matrix is becoming not invertible. If we go too large, you're affecting and changing too much the solution. So how does it look if we using then B splines for the same case where the linear shape functions fail looks good. It doesn't tear apart because mainly of the compact support that is now increased. So when we check out then the convergency between the different methods that I mentioned and between different combinations, we will see the following. So like for the small deformation case, when we choose a really small amplitude, actually most of the methods also like the standard MPM having uh, second order convergency for those different element sizes. When we look at the higher deformation, like B0.05, we see that some of the um, of the presented uh, methods and combinations will fail and will diverge. That's exactly the case which we've seen when the continuum is getting teared apart. So for wave propagation, just really shortly because I'm already extending the time too much, those kind of things are. Um, affecting the wave propagation strongly. Basically, when we have a, a arbitrary distribution of material points, the accuracy, as we could see, is strongly affected by it because the integration is strongly affected by it. So when we use, again, the same thing for the coupled wave propagation, we see that, for example, the standard MPM on such a uh, arbitrary distributed material point set oscillates strongly because there's not enough information or those material points are too close to the uh, out too far away from the um, Gauss point uh, position. When you're using higher order, moving the squares approximations, we are way closer to the solution as we've seen in the beginning, which was our reference. If we have a gap of an empty element, it's even worse because then the linear shape functions will lead to total reflection of stresses and, um, and pore pressures. Basically, the information that should propagate, as we have seen in the reference solution, will just stay in the in this part, because I introduced here an empty element at the, in the middle at 0 0.05. So let's use it with some Wendland function where we have the, I think the, the complex support is now 10 elements. And then we see that we can cross this, cross this gap with some oscillation, but the information is getting passed to the other half of the column. That's it. I'm sorry for a little bit extending uh, the time. So yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, it actually looks like we erroneously had an extra 15 minutes scheduled for you. So we do have time for some questions if anybody has any. Nothing in the chat. Any of the panelists have any questions?
All right. Well, you got a nice presentation in the chat. I guess there's some questions. <laughs> yeah, sure. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Alex. All right. Next up, uh, we have Abdel Al Sardi, and he's going to be talking to us about recent developments towards isogeometric MPM. Hello, Keely, and hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yep, sounds okay. good. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Keely, and thank you, everyone. Um, so I'm Abdel al um, and my topic today is um, to talk to you more about isogeometric, isogeometric material point method. My PhD advisor is Dr. Al Bayero, and my um, Los Alamos mentor is Dr. Christopher Long. I'm affiliated with both Los Alamos and Virginia Tech. Okay, so first of all, I'll give you some background briefly on the material point method and the isogeometric analysis concept. Uh, I will then move forward to 1D verification problems that have analytical solutions. Uh, so for example, the P-wave propagation problem, similar to what um, Alexander was showing um, and the column compression uh, under gravity, which is my second 1D uh, verification problem. I will then talk about um, a 2D example, a very uh, simple one, uh, which is the bending of elastic beam, and then uh, conclude my presentation and present to you some future work. Um, okay. So the material point method, um, as you've seen in all these presentations, it's a large deformation approach where, um, where the Gaussian points move within the grid. The traditional approach, which was first introduced by Salsky and others in 1994, is to use the hat linear interpolation functions uh, defined in a parent domain across each element. So in the physical domain, you might have an element. Uh, so for example, if you consider a Cartesian coordinate system where you have such a, a quadrilateral uh, element, um, we usually transform that into the parent domain, which is usually a two by two um, element. Um, which range goes from minus one to one in each direction. These two domains are connected by this Jacobian, which can be calculated by the derivatives of these shape functions and the coordinates of your uh, nodes of each element. Okay. Now in the material point method, um, there is the self-crossing error. This is because of the discontinuity in the shape function. It's a well-known error uh, that was um, coined as self-crossing er error in early 2000s. Um, and this self-crossing error uh, particularly occurs because we are more familiar with linear shape functions. Um, here, when we have linear shape functions, our derivatives of these shape functions are piecewise constants. And when the material points move from one element to another, uh, you get this self-crossing error uh, in your internal force, which is reflected in your acceleration solution. Uh, however, if we follow the similar approach using traditional FVM, where we use the same Lagrangian polynomial, but go higher order. Uh, so for example, let's take quadratic here and take it for five elements and say we have these uh, shape functions quadratic for each of these five elements. You notice that this discontinu discontinuity still exists. It's not eliminated. Um, so for just using higher order Lagrangian polynomials and MPM, uh, it's no good. It might reduce the crossing error, but it is no good for eliminating those discontinuities in your derivatives. So we use an approach called the isogeometric analysis. And the approach here is to use uh, a family of functions, um, which are non-uniform -ration, uh, non rational B-spines, um, which we commonly use in uh, CAD drawing. So if you've ever used a drawing tool or an AutoCAD drawing tool, you've used these nerves to draw your geometry. So the idea is to use the same exact functions as um, shape functions. So you have uh, the same functions in pre-processing and the calculation itself, okay? And I'll, uh, in this slide, I'll describe to you um, the spaces that we use for isogeometric analysis. The physical space, which I've already talked to you about in the previous um, in the previous slides, and which is also used in MPM, but also the parameter space, which is uh, newly introduced in this isogeometric analysis concept. We keep this parent space, which where we usually do our uh, integration, Gaussian integration quadrature. Okay. Now, if you um, take this surface as an example, if you see here in gray, the surface, we have um, scaffolding over it called the control, control net. Okay? These control points serve as nodes. For traditional um, MPM, we call these nodes, but in control point, but in isogeometric analysis, we call them control points because they control the geometry and they scaffold over this geometry to control um, the movement of this uh, surface. 
Now, all the information is mapped to these control points and the governing equations are solved at these control points, okay? Now, the, the new space that we're introducing is the parameter space, which is basically a space that wraps around your physical domain, ranges from zero to one. So if you imagine this point here corresponds to this point here, and this point here corresponds to this point here, and you define your shape functions in this space, they live in this space, and they wrap around your physical domain. So in this direction here, the C direction, uh, we call this um, using C eta and zeta coordinates. And here, this wraps around uh, your surface right here in both directions. So this, this edge is this edge here. And this space is defined using not vectors. Um, and you can see here in the capital C and the capital eta. And it's an input from the user. We retain our parent space. And that's where you have your Gaussian quadrature uh, integration happening. Okay, and each of these spaces, they are connected by a Jacobian, okay? So this space is usually denoted by C tilde. So if you see here, there's a tilde and it corresponds to the parent space, okay? And all of these are, are uh, connected by Jacobian. So for example, you have a dx by d tilde or a dx by uh, d c tilde or dx by d x, okay? Um, now the implementation, at the heart of this implementation is the cox de equation. We start by using a piecewise constant. So if your um, C lies between these two knots, then it's a one, otherwise it's a zero, and that's your piecewise constant. And it's a recursive equation where we have to move through the lower order um, shape functions to get the higher order. So to get the cubic, you're gonna need the quadratic. So if you see here, your nth i of p, p corresponding to the order, and this is the i um, shape function. It's a function of p minus one, okay? And here too, p minus one, and you have your inputs from your not vector. Now, the big advantage of this framework is that it provides you with very smooth solutions for stresses. So the, the derivatives of these shape functions are very smooth, and you can go as high order as you like. Now, complex geometries can also be um, simulated using uh, the weights for each of these control points. Um, however, it's advantage of that that you have to come up with these weights and you have to find a preprocessor that could give you these weights, which can be challenging at times and requires um, building up knowledge um, in that, uh, in that um, NURBS kind of uh, topic. The first example that I'm gonna show is the linear elastic P wave propagation. Um, in a similar fashion to what Alexander was showing. So in this case, we have no slip pressing happening and we're applying a traction of one KPA here. Um, and here I'm showing, um, so this traction stays there with the base fully fixed and rollers on the sides. Um, so here on the left, I'm showing MPM and on the right, I'm showing IGA MPM, assuming a cubic shape function. Um, and this, in the panels at the top, we have stress versus time and the panels below, we have displacement versus time. The analytical conclusion is plotted here in, in dotted lines, as you can see uh, in both, both of these um, graphs uh, in a similar manner also for the cubic. Now we see that the difference um, is not is not much, and we see that it's uh, pretty. Both of them are pretty satisfactory when it comes to matching the integral solution. Note that these uh, shock waves that we have, or shock kind of um, oscillations, are not due to uh, self-crossing error. There's no self-crossing error happening. It's just um, spurious noise that can come from the lack of uh, damping. We're not using any damping, and we're not using any um, dissipative integration schemes. Okay. Now, what if we increase this traction by 100 times to induce self crossing? Okay, so I'm going to increase this traction here at the top by 100. And we can look at the solution for MPM and IGA MPM. Okay, uh, now we see that um, although MPM here starts well, and even in displacement, looking at displacement time, it starts well. When we start getting that self crossing error, we start getting a drift in the displacement time and in the stress. And we see a severe oscillation when it comes to stress. However, in IGA MPM, because of the, um, so because our shape functions are cubic, the derivatives are quadratic, so we don't get that um, sharp uh, change in. Um, the internal force and we retain uh, this analytical solution although scaled by 100 times because we applied it um, by, we increased the factor by 100 times. And we can go even further to 500 kPa and our IGA MPM solution still remains acceptable. Uh, however, the drift is ex exacerbated further um, with very, very erroneous uh, displacement results when it comes to just looking at your typical MPM results, okay? This is MPM, just pure MP integration. 
Okay, now the second example that I will move forward with is the example with a high cell processing um, occurrence. So um, looking at one material point per cell and three material points per cell, we can generate uh, this column and we apply gravity. We increase gravity from zero to 12.5 G um, and we keep a fixed base at the bottom and rollers on the sides. And we're looking at the stresses. So on the y-axis I'm plotting um, here, the, the cross-section uh, or the global position of the material point, and on the x-axis, I'm plotting the stresses. So I'm showing you the stress profile, okay? And here we see that in MPM, although the analytical solution, although I'm, looking, I'm plotting here the analytical solution in dotted lines, although the numerical solution is oscillating within that analytical solution, um, we get large oscillations, um, particularly when we're looking at one material point per cell, it's a bit better when it comes to displacement with three material points per cell. However, when we increase the gravity to a large um, number of cell crossing, uh, it becomes erroneous as well. So moving forward, I'm, I'm gonna show the results for IGA and PM. So here I'm showing, for, I'm showing the results for cubic, um, cubic shape functions uh, and their derivatives, which are quadratic. Um, and here I'm showing the results for 1G and moving forward to 12.5G. Um, in one material point per cell, we see that the uh, uh, integration errors, the Gaussian integration um, errors uh, manifest here. It's not a cell crossing error, it's a Gaussian integration error. Um, however, as we start increasing uh, this um, number of material points, so here we're using two material points per direction per element, uh, we start seeing that these Gaussian integration errors start to reduce. In the same concept, I want to um, perform a, a parametric analysis where we use a very coarse mesh. So very, very coarse mesh. Uh, we're using only two elements, uh, 0.25 um, meters uh, as uh, an element, or I guess the correct term is a knot span, uh, knot span of 0.25 by 0.25. Um, and we're using one material point per element here, showing the results, the same fashion of global position versus stress. We see that the, although the results sometimes match the analytical solutions, we have a large degree of Gaussian integration. Um, Gaussian integration error when it comes to having a low number of material points. So increasing the, the number of material points to two material points per direction per knot span, we see that we start getting closer and closer to that analytical solution here in dotted lines, okay? And increasing it to three material points per, not span, per direction per knot span, we see that visually we can inspect the solution saying that it looks similar to what we would get from the analytical solution. Analytical solution. Now to take this more rigorously and perform a root mean square error uh, versus number of material points. So here I'm showing the equation for the root mean square error in a similar fashion to what Alexander was showing. <coughs> On the x-axis, we have that uh, root mean square error of stress. And on the x-axis, I'm showing the number of material points per cell, okay? And we see that as we start increasing the number of material points, our error in stress goes to super low um, error um, in the order of 10 to the negative five. And we see that it's still decreasing. The more material points you put in, the more it's decreasing. Um, and we claim that this approach can help you uh, go to uh, machine error when it comes to evaluating stresses. The next example I'm gonna talk about is the uh, 2D example of the bending of linear elastic beam. It's two dimensional example. So I'm practically having just a, a rectangular uh, beam and I'm applying the first flexural mode according to the Euler Bernoulli beam theory. I'm using C2 shape functions corresponding to cubic um, and I just let the beam go, okay? And I'm looking here at the axial stresses um, sigma of X. Uh, and as we can see here, um, a lot of slip crossing error occurs because I have a very fine mesh size with a very large number of cells, um, yet we still retain that smooth, um, smooth stress um, distribution. Um, and I plan in the future to compare this more rigorously to, um, to MPM, MP, and uh, MPM uh, mixed. Um, so in summary, uh, I've showed you this IGA MPM framework using B splines. It can be rational or non-rational, depending on the geometry that you're trying to uh, simulate. And it offers opportunity to improve the large deformations in MPM, particularly when we are interested in estimating stresses. Uh, I'm just showing here how smooth the, the cubic functions are. Um, so here we have the shape functions versus C, which is the, uh, the parameter domain. Uh, and we see how uh, we can retain that smoothness in the stresses. Future work. Uh, we can 
um, we, we are planning on going for more complex geometries and use more advanced physics models. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I acknowledge funding from Interlinear Studies at, at Los Alamos, National Science Foundations, and acknowledgement from um, and help from Jeed in the pre-processing part. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks, Adol. Nice job. Any questions? I, I would have one. <laughs> um, thank you for the nice presentation. I would like to know because um, so you, you need the the control uh, points to um, yeah to, to describe your geometry. And the last uh, example of the beam, like so, how many control points like the, the from the busier curve weightings for the uh, B splines have you used to uh, exactly? Uh, for for this example, okay. Uh, so you're saying how many how many control points did I use here? Yeah, yeah, like which are um, somehow out of the geometry or not aligned to the geometry. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I've used um, I can't remember the exact dimensions, but I've used um, a mesh size of zero point zero seven eight one two five, and there is um, four control points in each direction uh, because it's a cubic, so you need four control points. Yes. But but also um, we can say it's the number of cells multiplied by that because there's overlap. Uh, so it's actually less than what you would get if you would just use a uh, cubic FEM. Yeah. Um, uh, so I would say, uh, yeah, it's in the order of the number of cells multiplied by four, but a little bit less than that because of the overlap. But I can get back to you on the exact number. No, I, I think that would be interesting to see like um, how many like of those control points you need to describe the like such a large deformed uh, geometry because I think that's one of the nice things actually about uh, isogeometric analysis that you need less than just like exactly mapping it by the by the element nodes. Yes, exactly because of that overlap, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, okay. yes, I agree. Okay, thanks. Thank you for the question. Did this work for unstructured grids? Um, so intrinsically, the parameter domain is a structured uh, domain. Okay, but um, when we're looking at uh, when you have when you're using the weights, so for example, when you're using a um, when you're trying to simulate a curved geometry, then you would have to go for an un unstructured approach to find the local position of the material point. So it's kind of a hybrid structured unstructured approach. Um, so I would say intrinsically the parameter domain is structured, but we follow an unstructured technique to find the local position of the material point. So we are not restricted in that manner. Um, and we can also simulate complex geometries because of uh, the availability of weights for each control point. Okay. Thank you for the question. All right, thank you, Abdel. Thank you, Kaylee. All right, we've got one last presentation and it's a small change from our schedule, but Alba Yarrow will be talking to us about earthquake triggered landslides to wrap up this set of presentations. Yeah, so John Murphy, unfortunately, he could not be with uh, us here today, so I just prepared another presentation last minute. Let me share the screen. Um, screen. What do you see? Looks good. Okay. So, okay. The the work I will present here, which is earthquake trigger lines at NPM, actually is a uh, part of the 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 PhD of uh, Abdel Rahman Al Sardi, who was the previous presenter, uh, because one of the applications of the isogeometric elements that he just presented is also on the simulation of limestones as well, but in particular on earthquake triggered failures. So the motivation for this work was that large slope deformation occurs in most of or at least half of the uh, earthquake events that this causes huge um, damages to uh, human and to 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 humans and um, oops, and social um, and environmental um, uh, fields. So uh, 
And actually, current predictive uh, methods, such as numeric time methods, cannot capture large runouts and co complex nonlinear saw behaviors, such as liquefaction. And we feel that this, there is some fundamental question here that we still need to answer. So for that, we thought that MPM was a great tool for that, but there were still some features that there, the, when Abdel started his PhD, that they, they had to be developed. And some of them are summarized here. So the challenges to similar earthquake trigger landslides, landslide failures in MPM are uh, basically that we, in many cases, we have to deal with uh, some complex geometry or static of preconditions. We also need to simulate side response which is basically the amplification or attenuation of the seismic waves that uh, come from the bedrock. And we also need to deal with uh, uh, bands boundary conditions. So the waves do not reflect back to the boundary on those artificial boundaries. Also, we need to deal with constitutive models that, they, that can capture cyclic loading and high, high, uh, kinematic hardening. And finally, because soil in many cases, it's saturated, partially saturated, we need to deal with hydromechanical behavior. First of all, the first thing that Abdel implemented in his PhD was to deal with non-zero kinematic boundary conditions. Actually, uh, this is available in the Anura 3D um, open source code in terms of um, prescribed velocity from files. So you can impose a, a non-constant velocity. And we tried that together with a movic mesh technique that basically the mesh moves together with the input uh, velocity, time history. And we validated this um, implementation using an experimental model that was a small scale model on a shaking table. So this was ideal because literally our table was at the boundary of our numerical model. We had some material parameters that we could use for the, um, to, to include, to calibrate our MPM model also all required uh, information regarding the input motion was uh, available to us. We used an undrained uh, total stress analysis uh, with some um, strain softening, and we calibrated those parameters based on the laboratory tests available. So these are some of the results. You can see here the shaking on MPN, and then we also compare the final results, uh, the final displacement geometry with the experimental data. So in the dashed line is the initial geometry, and then the, the counter plots are MPM final results, and the, the continuous line is the final experimental profile. We see that in terms of runout, this, meet the, the, this fit very well. The shape of the landslide was slightly different, especially here at the crest. We could not capture the, the very discrete um, failure because of some of the limitations of FBM that it's uh, not a discrete, but a continuum based uh, model. Uh, but in terms of uh, when we compare horizontal displacement with some of the sensors, we could capture this behavior very well. Note that the sensors uh, fail in the, around this time, around uh, like 55, uh, 25 seconds. That's why the sensors did not uh, provide more data, but the initiation of the, fail, the, 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 the failure mechanism was well captured and overall the mechanism was um, captured um, acceptably. So after that, we said, okay, now we have to deal with side response. We need to make sure that the wave propagation through the, our model is correct. If we want to go to a larger model, no just like shaking box uh, type of analysis. So we focused on uh, the study of side response. So uh, starting from a very basic condition is a 1D column and we had to implement uh, the periodic boundary conditions. So Abdel basically included uh, these uh, conditions in, in, in the in-house uh, Anura 3D code. Uh, this was to ensure identical displacement in both uh, sides of the model for at the same uh, spatial level. So we had to ensure that the nodes on both sides were exactly at the same location uh, in the vertical direction. So we could uh, ensure this uh, periodic boundary condition. At the same time, we uh, Abdel implemented this MPM uh, MP relocation technique, which means that basically when we have cell crossing or material points leaving the leaving the leaving the mesh, this point is basically copied on the other side of the model, since to ensure this periodicity of the nature of this boundary condition. 
Uh, we have to deal also with other issues when we deal with when we face uh, cyclic or S wave triggered motions. One of the things is that NPM uses an explicit, uh, or traditionally NPM uses an explicit Euler Cromer uh, scheme uh, to integrate the time. These some of these oscillations were presented in Abdel's uh, previous presentation on the on the wave propagation. So those noise th that noise was coming because. Uh, we were using Euler Chrome scheme, but also we have to deal with self processing in a newer 3D. Those that were that are familiar with that, we have the MPM mixed integration that deals with part of this noise. But as Abdel presented in his uh, discussed in his presentation, this self processing is not fully um, uh, avoided. So uh, both of these. Um, uh, Features basically cause it high frequency numerical noise. That's for some of the problems. For many of the applications, maybe it's not a big issue. But if you want to simulate earthquake trigger lenses and properly propagate your wave across the model, uh, it's very important because we need to really capture this uh, the frequency uh, so that the, the the high frequency noise in all or no or not only high but low lower frequency, but especially in all ranges. So what Abdel did in his uh, in his work was to use a generalized uh, implementation of the Newmark type family, which is called the generalized alpha scheme in, in explicitly. So in particular, he used the um, the 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 an explicit version of that, and this is a time scheme. So some of the characteristics of this time scheme are that uh, we can maximize the dissipation at at high frequency noise. And uh, for the for the for the for lower frequency, we can uh, avoid dissipation. So the spectral ratio here uh, highlights. So this is the different uh, the the damping for different um, spectral ratios. And what we see here is that if the spectral ratio is zero, this means that the 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 wave or the the signal is fully damped. But if it's one, if it means that it's not damped at all. So this means that for a smaller or for lower frequency, there is no damping, but for higher frequency, we have a larger damping. This is a, an explicit uh, uh, scheme based on Herbert and Chang implementation in 1996. And basically the idea is that it evaluates acceleration at different intermediate steps. The stability of this, because this is an, still an explicit generalized, uh, an explicit scheme is uh, stability dependent. So we need to ensure that the minimal spectral ratio, which is uh, this uh, parameter here that controls where the minimal uh, spectral ratio happens for which frequency develops. And also it depends. So with that, we can uh, calibrate our uh, time in times, the minimum time step. On top of that, we also need to fulfill the current uh, Frederick Levy condition. But the nice thing of this is that we, the user has control of what uh, frequencies do you want to dissipate. In our models, we are it's as accepted in earthquake trigger lines or earthquake uh, uh, in the earthquake uh, field. Uh, high frequencies larger than 35 hertz are usually this uh, try to be so we want to damp them or the, just uh, remove them from the analysis. I will skip this slide. So uh, you you have uh, some of these in in Al Sardi in Yero 2023. Basically, we um, uh, um, validated the, this implementation using a one D column, and we compared the NPM results with uh, FEM because this is still in small deformation. So we can still compare that with FEM. In, in particular, we use Plaxis that uses a new Mark beta uh, analysis. So for example, uh, this is a, the solution for a 1D problem. Uh, we use a non-regular uh, time velocity time history that actually is represented here in green. This is the applied ground motion. And this is for a small, the very small deformation for, for a very small ground motion. So there is no cell crossing. And here we are comparing uh, for X and Y direction, but specifically for the two schemes, NPM Euler Cromer, that we see that in black that we have a lot of noise. And then in red, it's the NPM generalized alpha, and in blue is this NPM benchmark. So we see that generalized alpha uh, works pretty well. It matches very well the, the, the FEM numerical results. 
Also, if you plot this in the frequency domain, we represent here the transfer function versus frequency. Um, these gray lines basically um, are natural frequencies for that particular system. And we see that uh, with a basic MPM Euler Cromer, we have uh, a, a, a huge amplification of especially high frequency noise. Instead, if we use this generalized alpha, we can down frequencies that are larger than 35 uh, hertz, which is what, that, what we wanted to target. What happens if we have larger formation with cell crossing? So actually, the results uh, are this is exactly the same vertical uh, 1D uh, column. And we compared here the MPM, MP integration with the mixed MPM uh, Gauss point integration that is implemented in Anura 3D. And we see that uh, if we use MPM Euler Cromer, um, the, even using MPM mix, MPM mix still has some noise. So you see actually, if you compare this to the, 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 um, the scale of these two graphs is, is very different. And so we minimize this noise using MPM generalized alpha, either for MP integration or MPM mix. Again, this is uh, the same analysis, but presented in frequency domain. Uh, using MPM generalized alpha, we can um, ensure that, uh, that the noise is reduced in higher frequency um, noise, in the higher frequency range. We use this uh, implementation to study, this was a numerical parametric anal analysis. We did not compare with, exp with experimental or field case histories, but this was just a, an exercise uh, using uh, this general alpha and the periodic boundary conditions. We studied the, the effects of shaking intensity and different embankment sizes and material brittleness on runout. Uh, if you are more interested on, on this work, it's, uh, you can find it in, in this reference. We use different input motions. And at the end of the day, we presented this plot where uh, for different uh, um, earthquake uh, intensities, we can uh, get different uh, permanent displacement or runout in the horizontal direction. And we saw that uh, the effect of uh, the, the scale, basically also larger scale, uh, you also always have larger runout and also for brittle materials, the runout is highly dependent on the residual uh, strength. Finally, we this is current work that actually submitted to Purdue Congress 2024, and uh, this is the same uh, the same scheme is um, applied on uh, on undrained effective stress analysis. So here we uh, develop for pressure as the shaking is uh, moving forward because. Also, we added a uh, constitutive model that accounts for um, uh, cyclic effects, which is integral or strain anisotropy uh, hypoplastic model, and this is an ongoing research. So here you have the, the references in case you want, and well, thank you uh, to the annual community, and thank you everyone for being here, actually. Uh, this is everything from my side. Thanks, Alba. Does anyone have any questions? I have a question. Is this um, generalized alpha scheme computationally more expensive than the Euler scheme? Up, up there, maybe you can answer this because you have the times more in head. Uh, sure. So basically, we just um, store the information of the acceleration from the previous time step, but the calculation is not, we're not iterating over anything. So it's just uh, an interpolation using the generalized alpha terms, um, and we do not evaluate any new accelerations for new iterations. It's just an interpolation. So the additional cost is just the interpolation between um, the previous acceleration and the new acceleration, or the intermediate acceleration to get the n plus one acceleration. So it's just um, an additional interpolation function that's added to do that, but it's not um, significantly more expensive. And in terms of time, inter so the time, the minimum time step, you still need to, to we still need to deal with very small time, uh, uh, minimum time step. So it's, it's very similar. Thanks. 
I don't see anything in the Q and A. Um, I think we can probably move into the the closing general discussion Actually. unless anybody has any more specific questions. Yeah, I just again, I just wanted to thank everyone and and uh, yeah, if you have any any comments on on the software, use the discussion. Uh, so if you don't want to to start the discussion now, but you can have more ideas later, use the discussion uh, section feature in the GitHub uh, repository that we have there. And we try to answer as soon as possible, as soon as our schedule allows. Um, yeah, one. Can Anura 3D apply concentrated force load? I want to load the size to load the seismic load on the structure as from of equal effect. Um, I don't know, maybe Abdel can. Um, concentrated, you mean like the pseudo static kind of approach where you have like a body force applied at the center of a slope and you're like pushing through. Um, we don't have that implemented, so it's not an implemented approach, but if, that, if that's what I'm just saying, it's just one big body force at the, at the center of a slope and it's kind of like pushing it as opposed to uh, applying a time history. We don't have that implemented I think, um, uh, the, sorry for the interruption, I think we could, this could be done just by changing the gravity, the gravity orientation and the amount uh, and, and the, the modulus of the gravity. I don't think you need to apply a specific force. If this is the question about, I don't know, if, the, if you want to run a sort of static analysis, you could basically change the, the orientation of the vector and the amount and the modulus of that, which is in the CPS. Yes, that's across like each material point. But I think he was trying to say that what if you have like a concentrated like in in, in like one sliding mass that you can like. Um, but but yes, yes, I agree. I think you can if you're if you're applying that gravity for each material point, then you should be able to do um, gravity just changing the orientation of that vector. Yeah, if he's on a on a slope or on a structure. Thank you. Can we simulate the cyclic loading in Anura 3D as a release? Would altering GOM file be enough? Uh, I think I can answer the question. Yes. Right? Yeah. Uh, so we, we don't have everything from the seismic or the cyclic implementations within the open source release. Uh, but in terms of applying a prescribed velocity from a file, that is there. Uh, we also do not have a tutorial that you can follow through and, and do, but if you can follow through with what's in the flags in the open source code, you can, um, you can create your own, um, you can add specific flags in the CPS and the GOM file to simulate that cyclic shaking. Um, but that is the plan. We are moving in that direction to move it all open source. Where can we find the tutorial to use Anura? I, I am copying the link now. Yes, so the tutorial are in our uh, website, uh, plus there are some video tutorial in our YouTube channel. I have to say that those tutorials were created with uh, an older version of the code. Now the GID problem type look a little bit uh, different, but uh, I think you won't have any difficulties uh, in um, performing the new simulation with the new problem type if you follow the old tutorials because it's somehow very similar. I just send the link. Yes.
Is it possible to write a simple description on how to install a new version of Anura 3D over an old version of Anura 3D? This is because Anura 3D has new version every year. Um, not actually, we are not a software like the commercial one, let's say Plaxis or others where you need to overwrite or update a version. We simply have a new executable. So you can replace the new executable in, in the project, project folder and, uh, and that's it. <laughs> the only thing you need to do. And we don't even provide the executable. The executable. I mean, we provide the source files, and you 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 compile the executable from that from there. So there yeah. is no need for a new installation or anything like this. Actually, the new execute the new source code, when it is compiled, it will be able to read the, uh, all the input file of Anura 3D 2022 for sure, but maybe also the previous one, 2021, I guess. Yeah. 21 for sure, yes. So the new code is compatible with the previous versions. Okay, it's it's time, I think. Maybe just uh, before we finish, Alexander and Luis, do you want to mention about the workshop and the conferences? That these are the last announcements. Yes, I think yes, Luis, uh, Luis, you can start because yours is fixed. Ours is still to be announced. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you for the opportunity and, and thank you all uh, speakers and panelists uh, for, for this uh, workshop. Yeah, so next uh, event is going to be the 14th MPM US workshop uh, that is going to be host here at the University of Maine in Orono. It's going to be uh, in person, but we also have the option to broadcast the, the workshop uh, for those who are interested. And, and this is a great opportunity to learn uh, uh, advancements of the methods in different areas uh, other than geotechnical engineering as well. So that's going to happen in September 14th and 15th this year. And you can already go to the web page and submit your abstracts if you have. And if you want to present, but you're also welcome just to attend the workshop. Yes. And um, another big event that we are planning will take place in 2024. So next year in September, the details will be announced soon. So just visit our site, just follow the news that we have there. Um, we will announce the third international uh, conference that we will now host, like since 2000 or 2017, I guess, was the last one. And okay. yeah, due to COVID, we, we wanted actually to keep up as a community and make it every second year. Uh, and unfortunately, due to COVID, we couldn't. But now, finally, <laughs> we will... Uh, organize it so yeah we will update you soon or just visit our site there will be an announcement and yeah. in september 24 we would like to welcome you all in hamburg and yeah submit your publication hmm? are there more technical questions there is one question about humans the oh, other could, yeah Maybe Pietro wants to. And Jessica just answered. Oh, but, uh, you already answered. Okay. All right. Oh, well, the UMAT, uh, we, you need to compile the DLL with a new interface between the software Anura 3D and uh, the UMAT itself. But this is explained in our tutorial manual in chapter. And I think if then they are more interchangeable with the Plexus one and not the Abacus one. Like uh, also Abacus. No, we tested our UMAT with Abacus. But I, th I think there was some kind of different numbering in the in the stress tensor and in, in Abacus. Numbering the stress tensor. No. I'm not sure. Pietro actually would no, know, no, but don't... he is not there. No, okay. I think it's the same. It's just the interface in the. I think it's the same. Yes. Okay. No, it's the same. Well, actually, to use the one from uh, Blaxis, you should adapt it a little okay. bit. 
Ah, okay, so it's still Adam. So you hear the voice of Pietro? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I thought that she's gone. <laughs> like a ghost. <laughs> yeah, you can use uh, either the human standard or the plus or the plexus one. Uh, the one we are discussing in the tutorial is from is the UMAT, but if you change uh, a few stuff, then you can use the the the, the, the plexus standard as well. So, if you want to refer to one model implemented on soilmodel.com, for example, which are available both in UMAT and and plexus um, implementation, you can yeah you simply refer to the example in chapter four where the interface the interface is described. And yeah, you have to compile a DLL and include it in uh, in the folder where you are executing the the code, and that's it. And well, and then specific assign the material. Well, define the material model as an external soil model. But yeah, all this is discussed uh, in chapter four. There is one question on the input motion for the cyclic. So we don't, answer. yeah, you can answer it. No, 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 sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 no go ahead. Uh, okay, sure. So basically uh, we do not uh, modify the CPS. So there are different types of multipliers. There's a linear multiplier, there's a step multiplier, there's a multiplier from file. Uh, if it's a linear multiplier, then that's when you have like interpolation, um, also similar for that step. Uh, but for a multiplier from file, which what you should use for a cyclic kind of load, um, then you would have to input your ground motion um, or your whatever sinusoidal load from file. And then uh, with time. So at each time you have a, um, you have like a frequency rate for each of these um, Point. So every few seconds, then you have every fractions of seconds, you have a particular reading. And then based on um, the time, the overall real time that you are in, uh, you interpolate to get that multiplier from file. And you multiply that by the boundaries that you've assigned in your GOM file. And this um, is already implemented in Anura. So the only input you need is a file that has, I think it's basically two columns. No, one is the velocity input and the, the time for that velocity. And you can prepare this input file being a sinusoidal load or being a non-sinusoidal load. But you don't need to manually change the multiplier because this is already included in the code. Mm -hmm. There are two formats that the code can read. The first format is just from table, the time versus and whatever uh, velocity or acceleration you have. And the second format is the AT2 or the VT2 or DT2 from the peer database, depending on the ground motion you want to simulate. Okay. No more questions. I think it's time. I'll just stop recording. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>